the and we're going to call this to order. First up is public comment. This is anything that's not on the agenda. See nothing. We'll go to approval of the agenda. Um, I'd like to make a motion to amend the agenda to include liquor control board. Is that the proper way to do that? Okay. Oh, we can't because we pulled in the select board. We'll have to do. Was the advertising? So yeah, so what you'll do is add it to the agenda, um, and then when you get there, you have to resource, recess the select board, mm -hmm. and you'll convene board of liquor control, close that, and reconvene the select board. Because by the time these got to us, it was too late to amend the agenda. And it was an internal mm -hmm. routing issue, not the fault of the applicants, which is why we're suggesting trying to do it now yeah, rather than... We don't have to reconvene the select board afterwards. Right? That's true if you we just... We can finish the select board, then convene liquor control and be done. Oh yeah, you could okay. add it at the end okay. if you want, yeah. Okay, cool. I'll make a note, but I will not guarantee I'll remember it. Okay. So, so you'll do a second to amend, yeah. yeah. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Consent calendar. Those meeting minutes and notes. Motion to approve us. Present it. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Under the business agenda, we have the changes to the land use regulations. This is an update and timeline discussion. We held this one over in case there was any additional conversation or anything anybody wanted after extra review. If there isn't anything else, what we'll do is we'll head toward the public hearing in May. There are some special warning requirements for that in terms of the time we need to provide advance notice within. Um, and so we'll get rolling on that unless somebody has anything on particular to the land use regs. I've gone through them a few times now, so. Any more Anybody here for that? Topic. Okay. Staff. Let's see, go ahead with it. Okay. Jeff, make a note. I don't know. I'll make a note too. Between <laughs> us, we'll probably do it. Yeah. All right. Uh, RACDC's request related to Salisbury Square road construction. So, Mark is on. He's been working with, and Julie's here in the room with you. He's been working with them on this. So, maybe Mark can run you through the background. We've got you a few items earlier today that can kind of take you through what's being asked, why we're here, et cetera, and so forth. Yeah. Hi. Uh, hi, uh, everyone. The uh, I'm speaking uh, regarding the surety bond that's required uh, as a condition for the. Uh, the zoning permit that was issued through the DRB, um, and to uh, this is obviously for the the Salisbury Square uh, building project that our CDC has been working on for several years. Uh, they they are they are as part of that zoning permit, they're seeking a uh, road adoption, <clears throat> and uh, in order to do that, uh, there are a number of uh, there are a number of uh, things that have to be uh, clarified, which. Uh, which I think RACDC and Julie will will go over with you tonight. But the you know the essence of what I'm here to do is to explain the how the surety what the obligations are for the surety bond. Um, essentially, the full costs of construction for the road uh, for the road development uh, plus 15% contingency, um, in addition to a few other details, which I can kind of throw on the table once you've had a chance to. To listen to Julie. I'm Julie. <laughs> I'm Lynn with the RICAC. Um, so, in a nutshell, um, we're asking the town, and we've talked to the suburb several times before about this, but we're asking the town to adopt the road once the road is completed. The construction project will pay for the construction of the road. Um, and um, Mark and Trevor, and I think Jeff is there, and I had a meeting on February 19th to sort of go over the process in an effort to sort of come up with a, an agreement on what that process would be for going forward with that. Um, 
part of that process is that the town would have an engineer to review the steps of the project to make sure that it was, you know, that the town had an oversight opportunity along with our engineer oversight of the construction process and that the, um, and when the road was completed, that um, then the town would be asked to formalize the adoption and that the town would then own an easement to be able to maintain that road and um, all of the underground um, water wastewater utilities as well. Um, I have unfortunately not two great printed copies of the portion of the road that we suggested the town would adopt and this is essentially I don't know if you can see this, but there's a loop road essentially at Salisbury. It's Salisbury Street sort of um, continues into the development. And then there is a, a turn that becomes West Village Lane and it creates kind of a square, a rectangle. Um, and we suggested that the town sort of adopt that portion of the road and that um, and that RACDC retain or the condo or the, um, the Planned Community Association retain um, the management of the two sort of driveway um, dog legs and the parking areas. Now, this is the, the reason was because those, um, those dog legs um, only serve one or two homes each. They're essentially driveways now, not roads as a result. They end in a sort of snow storage area, kind of, and so the town, if it wishes, we could grant access to that, but we thought it might be easiest for the town to just do a loop with their snow removal rather than to try to, you know, go left, go right. Um, and so um, once the, um, as a part of this process, then the, um, our engineer has prepared and presented to the DRB and has presented to Trevor and Mark as well um, the rationale for why the road um, the road um, specs as they have been developed meet all the town standards. There are several town ordinances that um, are involved. There's curb cuts. There's road adoption policy, and there's some other things. And so. We have an engineer's letter that's been submitted um, as to how we meet those standards. And now we're waiting for, essentially, come to the select board and ask that, um, and, then, and I should this is where I was hoping Trevor could help too with the, we'd hope to have a, a sort of a draft letter of that outlined that adoption process. Um, I have note, I'm reading from notes from following our meeting, but essentially, We'd like to get the town's, the select board's sort of understanding and agreement that we would go through this process with an intention that if all goes well, the road would be adopted. And obviously, the engineers have to get involved, review the specs, make sure that we concur initially that we do indeed meet the specifications if it's built as, uh, as outlined. And then when it's done, and when it's inspected and agreed that the process was, um, the, or the development process was followed and it meets the specs, then the town would adopt the road. And I, Trevor, when you were away, I said I was hoping that you would weigh in a little bit on the process thing. I was just out reading from my notes from our meeting as to what we had hoped to do. Oh, there, that's much better, much easier to read. You said you're not looking for the town just to adopt the road, but to adopt all the water and sewer infrastructure for this development also? Well, I think the water infrastructure is largely already adopted, um, and we would be adding some to that. Um, the sewer infrastructure is not yet adopted, um, and we would be adding to that and ask that that be adopted as well. And that was in the DRB request as well. own the access in the road around your development on, down on Pedding? 
Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. The town owns yeah. cutting. But do we own in and around the buildings that you've got there? No. No, that's just driveway. With all the various applications there, it's well, that's I'm guessing that's what I wanted to try to put that up for everybody. The loop road idea with the spur. Yeah. And there has been there has been discussion of this prior years earlier and votes at least um, in favor <coughs> of the concept of the town taking over the road. And just in case to I'll back ask. up a little bit, so the Salisbury Street development is a an affordable housing development of rental and single family that's going to be um, mixed income, um, affordable to anywhere between very low to middle income. So the process conversations have focused on what do you need to do to be in the pipeline to get to a point at the end to be considered for adoption or acceptance by the board. So I thought we were at two, not at a, we've committed to anything. Because at the end of it would still be part of this process is us finding an engineer who will then sit in on the process from design, do checks, and then be able to do a final inspection to certify, yep, this was built in accordance with all of the specifications. And who would pay for the engineer? The applicant would. Okay. Yeah. We have all we can do to keep up with what we got. Why do we want more? Well, I mean, I've just spent two days with the highway department on roads and issues. Like, I'm not kidding that we have our hands full. Understood. I mean, this was proposed initially and requested as a part of making this development possible to continue to be affordable to the people there. And also, our engineer did, you know, a cost evaluation. Um, as part of the analysis and you know we're adding property value of you know just this part of phase two of something like five million dollars not including the single family um, this is going to add to the grand list pretty substantially and it is a road, it's an extension of an existing road and a new road, um, an extension of the other road, West Village Lane. So the discussion much earlier when we had that vote of confidence was that this is the way the town is contributing to helping make this project work. What's there now for a road? Yeah, in fact, you were so in the first phase, this just for this is day few normal and it's done here. So this is Salisbury Street. Salisbury Club's in here and when this first phase was developed, just this essentially this was developed in the parking for the building in the home stair. Right. And so this finishes okay out all the rest of the infrastructure. Who takes care of that piece net currently? Currently we do. You do, not yeah. the town. Not that now okay. it wasn't completed. Yep. And we would continue to take care of the parking area. Yeah. The, yeah. Uh, the rough shape here. Yep. Yeah. Does the town now own Salisbury? We, we own just what's there now. Gotcha. We don't own beyond that. Sort of from like here to here ish, mm -hmm. or there, wherever that seam is. And this is all privately owned still. Thereabouts. And I guess underneath the police station is all privately owned. Mm -hmm. Same there. 
you know, there's also a lot of you know, discussion by funders and things asking what the town contribution to this you know, new town asset was going to be. And one of the things that we had discussed with the town before, we told them that was the road adoption, which would be an more enormous help to the continuing viability of the planned community because it's, you know, for lower middle income people, it's not going to be feasible for them to take on high homeowner association fees. They'll take on some for what we would manage, but, you know, road uh, maintenance is not something that homeowner associations are terrifically good at, nor do we want to burden them with, them with that cost. But the ongoing tax, um, taxes from development will, um, and I can give you these figures um, from the engineer, more than pay for the ongoing cost of that road development. This is the, you know, this is his um, memo, and I think he just used the rental and infrastructure part of this for those figures. There's no snow storage. There's no nothing on here. Like we're going to be trucking snow away after every storm. There's no place. And before I wanted to go much further, I'd want somebody to look at this from a maintenance and whatnot perspective. Not only do we have enough, but this is a nightmare for somebody to maintain. And may, may I say something? Uh, yeah. The the conversation of of snow remo removal came up during uh, both during the preliminary um, hearing with the DRB and the final hearing, and the conversation also came up with uh, we. I did talk with John uh, on the road department about the the uh, the road and what was happening. He's he's also had a chance to look at the. Uh, you know the the site plan and the one of the conditions uh, and and RACDC is aware of this and uh, is that uh, an agreeable method of plowing uh, the the road uh, is is going to you know it has to happen uh, so the the idea of how and where the the snow would go was discussed at length in in the like I said, both the preliminary and the final uh, DRB meeting. So I don't, I understand your your concern, but I, I do think it was addressed uh, substantially and the engineers at Du Bois and King were there uh, responding to the questions of the DRB members as well. And so you cut out for a little bit there. Where did they say they were gonna store all this snow? They were, they were, well, there was, there was a, there were, again, I'm, I'm, if memory serves, they were going to be pushing some of the snow off of some of those legs. Um, but they, they made, I, I don't have the information in front of me now, but the, and I do think that we could certainly bring back, and I think we should uh, bring John and the, and the, the, the road crew team back out there and do an additional walks to, uh, and have them look at the site plan to make that determination of the best way for the snow to be removed. Yeah, yeah I and mean, there's soil. Even if it is, because there's no way the maintenance of that road is only going to take $375 a year. That's just unrealistic. That's yeah. averages, you know, that are used in the, you know, Yeah, budget. but there's no way. It's just not, like one time of moving snow is going to be more than $375. Well, you can yeah. come up with your own calculations if you want. He was using standards that are... Well, no, he's using a per mile fee for all our roads. You take all our roads that are straight, you can do it cheaper when you're just going down the road, blowing the snow to the side. I mean, this is a pretty complex situation, even for snow removal. Well, again, I, I will say this. We've been talking about this as a town for quite a while. We're coming to the point where this development needs to go forward and we're at critical point in that right now. We have made ourselves available to answer any and all of these questions for a long time and I'd ask only that we do that, that we you know honor the fact that this has deadlines upcoming and this is a big development 
it's going to be a great development for the town. It's going to help people with housing, and we're asking for a little help from the town in return. Um, doing something that the town is good at, you know, if the towns are full or this kind of infrastructure maintenance. We're going to develop it. It's not going to cost the town anything to develop it. We'll pay for the engineer's oversight. We'll build it to the specs provided, but we need um, to move this ahead, and it's been hard to get there. Um, so um, if this is going to happen, we need your help. Yeah, I, would, I would say that you know even you know given the the maintenance costs of the town taking over the uh, infrastructure <clears throat> as described um, the benefit to the town both, in, both to the municipality financially directly into the town in a, in a much greater sense of is vastly outweighs the potential costs and, and as Julie was saying this project has been in the works for a, a very long time we're getting very close to to getting it accomplished um, I, I really don't want to see it get delayed or jeopardize its, its continuation in, in any way. And, um, and you know, it did go through the DRB process. Um, as far as I can tell, they do really thorough, good work, and I really have a lot of trust in their ability to think through a lot of these issues. Um, so I, I would love to see us sign off on, you know, taking over the roads and do it as soon as we feasibly can. But at this point, I think we really owe it to the process and really just owe it, owe it to the town and it could create some more work. I mean, obviously it'll create more work with more infrastructure, um, but um, it seems like well worth the extra effort. I think it's fair to let John look at the plan and what's there and see if they, you know, what it's, what it's going to involve. We it sounds like John has, with the DRB it sounds like John's already, John has already been involved in scoping this out. I didn't get that impression from the conversation today about it. But, I, th I thought that's what Mark had just said. We, well, we may want to, it wouldn't hurt to look at it again. That's all. So I think it was a quicker conversation on the move. It might, just to make sure everybody's satisfied. Would the town also then be cleaning the sidewalks too? Or is it just? No flat just from the roads. There are sidewalks that were required by the DRB. Those, again, we assume that that would be part of it. If it's not possible, we could talk about doing that through the planned community. Um, again, we submitted these plans, you know, months and months and months ago, offered to go over that with our engineers and anybody else. It's just um, hard to keep you know, waiting, yeah. not knowing with um, so many things that need to move forward. So happy to answer questions, happy to help, happy to negotiate things like that if we need to. But um, there's, you know, tens of millions of dollars on the line right now. Um, you submitted them to what, to the DRB months and months and months ago? To John, oh well, John, John is the public works too. He submitted the public works, the roads application with the DRB application for this reason. And um, the plans were submitted for the DRB uh, two months ago. We had a meeting with the four of us to talk about process and plan. And, you know, I'm at the end of a knife right now and um, our funders and our you know in fairness like this just came to us this week so we're just getting this and trying to get our head around what it means what it involves is it going to require specialized equipment is it is there even snow storage area this board isn't the DRB so we don't have that history that background that information so you know, trying to come up to speed in a couple days and be asked to take on an asset like this but is a little tough for us to say yes. I'm just saying it shouldn't be a couple days. We've been engaged in this discussion for a long time. Well, if we're going to do this, we've had other stuff to do as well. So if this I is understand. really where we're going, Julie, no, we've no. had other things on our plate. I understand. I just need some clarity about time frame, and we're happy to do whatever it needs, whatever you need. We have been happy to do that. But there's like we need a like a good faith kind of come to agreement on a time frame for that. 
theory as we're not sorry. Yeah, they would have all the detailed plans. They would have, I mean, we don't have it. Yeah. They would have it. So, but I think Ooh. somewhere you got to have some level of comfort from the person we're going to ask to do this. Like, does this plan even make sense? Is this even anything, you know, what is this? Or what modifications can we I mean, make to make it, it easier? It looks to me like we're get, if you look at the area, there's you're, any snow event, you're going to be in there at night with trucks and loaders taking snow out. That's a huge cost. Julie, was there any space there for snow store? Like, how would that work that they would plow all the snow into one area and then have to remove it at night, potentially? So there are two dog legs at the end of which there's snow storage. On the side of Salisbury, one side of that road, and this, these are questions I asked, like, well, kind of like, because I, I don't know how you turn blades or whatever, you know. But on one side of that road, um, it's just draining, you know, swales. Um, and so that can go there. On the other side, there's parking along part of the road, and beyond that parking is all uh, open. There's from the corner where the existing house is to the turn, there's no structures. So um, even if the plow just plowed in the parking and we went back later and took a parking, you know, there had to be notice or something like that. We could think about that. I'm not an expert on that. That's what I've been asking. And I think the DRB requested and we agreed to change the direction of one of the roads to accommodate this, you know, to accommodate a better circulation pattern. And we incorporated that into our plans. Um, but um, this has been, you know, it's been out to bid. Um, there's, this is the same essential, um, essentially the same configuration that was permitted back in 20. 2009, it's the same road because all you know, a lot of utilities are already in there. Um, so, so it's a one way loop, right? Yeah, so you kind of come down turn. The parts of it are two way, but okay, that northern part is, 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 is one way, right? Two way up, so, we changed the, the orientation of the parking spaces right. on so the end. So, so just as a, uh, wait, a random oh. Need to keep the meeting, move, meeting moving. So no. I'll I'll Please. call on you if you want okay. to speak. Okay. But we just gotta keep this going here for a second. It, it has it has to do with this subject. Understood. Okay. I'll get to you. Yep. It's, it sounds like Mark was pretty involved in the DRV process, and he talked a little bit about it. But I wonder if he would be willing to clarify for us the steps that the DRB went through, who you, who you heard from, and what kind of conclusions were drawn around snow removal. Okay, the, from my recollection, and I, we can go back and look at the, uh, the final uh, determination, but the, uh, the condition was that the, the condition for the town to adopt and manage the roads going forward now you have to remember the original 2009 DRB uh, or zoning permit. It was RACDC that was was responsible for everything, and the, one of the biggest reasons why we came back to the table was to remove that part of uh, that section in the in the zoning permit and and allow the town to to take over because of the size and scope of the project. It it made sense. For, for RACDC to make that request. Um, and so we had several meetings uh, with the DRB to talk about um, what steps would need to be done in order for the town to consider that adoption. Like Julie just said, the, uh, we prepared a, an application for the, the road crew for, that the supervisor, John, looked at. Um, again, this was a preliminary application, but the extent of it was he saw the um, he saw that the site map, the, trip, the site plan that you're looking at now, and he he agreed to sign off on it. Um, but again, the, the the understanding was that we needed to we needed to have a real sense and clear understanding of the snow removal process for 
uh, for the project, understanding the importance of the project in terms of the, the units, the housing units that were coming into town. So the the, the essence or the the questions relating to that were were answered by Julie by their engineers and the stipulation in in the newly issued zoning permit is simply that we come to an understanding and an agreement uh, with RACDC um, and the town road department on, on the best way to remove the snow. The, the understanding was also that it was achievable uh, based on the conversation that they had with the engineers that were on that were there. Uh, the people that were professional and, and did the math in terms of how the road was designed, that it would work. Um, and I think uh, it was pretty clear that we all felt comfortable. And I understand that it's not the select board that was speaking, but the engineers, uh, both the engineers on the DRB and the engineers that were working on behalf of our ACDC, that the cyclone that you're looking at would, in fact, allow for adequate snow removal. It's snow storage, Mark. Where's the snow storage? Right. I, like I said, I, I'm, I'm also not. We that on the site plan, right? Yep. It's, I don't have the, that answer, uh, but we can certainly get it for you. Was, there, was it determined when you did the DRB process that there was plenty of area on site for snow storage? As far as I recollect, yes, there was. Um, you know, there are always circumstances we... It, it, it depends on the amount of snow we're talking about. If it's a if it's a garden variety snowstorm, yes. I and mean, if we have a 30 inch storm, perhaps it's a different story. Uh, in the same manner that it would be, you know, in other parts of our downtown. Um, and I think what what Julie was trying to to mention was that yes, it's going to be uh, an additional expense. But the the calculations were made, um, and those submissions were given to to us at the town. To, to look at those numbers to make sure that you had a full sense of where the how the grand list was going to uh, be what was going to be reflected in, in terms of additional revenue on the grand list and how much those costs were going to be um, and those costs were done uh, not just once but at least twice from the engineers and sent to us so we had a sense of what we would be up against, we as in the town, uh, in terms of maintaining the road. And of course, I don't think we, it is our goal as part of the, the town plan uh, to, to increase housing in the downtown. And this is, in fact, this is a huge win for us. So, you know, there, even, you know, even that 100% of the cost may not be covered, you know, this is, this is an extraordinarily important project, and um, I do hope that you, you have a chance to, to to review and get your questions answered. And but I do know that Julie, she's you know, she's in the ninth inning on this project. The funding is almost all there. We, you know, the and the delays that she's talking about could in fact be deleterious to the project. So if we if you can't come to an answer tonight, I I just hope that we can come. On her behalf, we can come to an answer fairly soon, so we don't run the risk of those type of delays that could put the project in jeopardy. I don't think she's. I don't. I believe her when she says that. You know, we we really do need to support this project to, to bring it to completion, and so the. Anyways, that's, that's my comment. So, Mark, can you pull for us and share with the board the. Uh, site plan that was <coughs> used by the DRB showing snow storage areas. There, there, there isn't a site plan that shows snow storage areas. The the conversation um, between the engineers on the DRB and the engineers that were there at both the preliminary hearing and the final hearing, uh, they discussed the the snow removal. And I think the reason why, particularly Matt. Uh, Murawski, the chair of the DRB, put the condition in the approval of the zoning permit that the 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 road foreman, the road crew, was in fact satisfied with a plan uh, that was implemented prior to the completion as part of that whole process of adopting the road. Um, 
you know, again, the DRV, well, the, does that answer your question? Is there a, so let me get this, I, the DRV condition in the zoning permit was that the road crew foreman had to be satisfied with the plan or that, is that how that's written? Uh, well, it's written, I'll have to go back and get the formal okay. language for you, but the, the gist of it is that we, there need, we need to come to an agreement that uh, that we feel comfortable with the snow removal uh, because it, it's in fact the, you know, the, 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 the objective here, of course, is to maintain positive relations and make sure they're not the road crew that wasn't getting into anything that was going to be over their head to do or be too much for the town. Right. So that was the primary reason for uh, for the condition in the in the permit, um, so I, I I'd have to go back and look at the actual wording, which I'm, I'm sorry I didn't have right now. So maybe we can get the the um, conversation or the minutes of what what the conversation was around that, and then maybe the draft the permit that was signed, so we can see like what that means. And unfortunately, Julie, these legs, we can't go down with the town equipment. We just went through this on some other roads, and that's not a town road. So we, we're not, you know, that's like we had some where people were turning around on people's, in people's door yards, and then they tear up the lawn, and then it becomes the town's problem and whatnot. So when we went through that whole process of giving up all those segments of road a few years ago, that's what it was about. So we'll be looking for is how do we remove the snow in that gray shaded area so that it doesn't create yeah so yeah, one of the, one of the proposals uh, was also that the town um, it originally the engineer stated that they weren't um, as part of the proposal the town wouldn't be responsible for going off onto these side, these two side paths uh, at all it would just be to circle around um, and remove the snow accordingly that way um, but it was it was brought up by one of the DRV members that it, it may in fact be easier to go down one of those for snow uh, for depositing some snow so that was uh, it was actually one of the ideas as a potential way to actually store that snow if I remember right Julie you can correct me well there's actually a built-in turnaround yeah. uh, at the end of the dog leg so there is a turnaround okay. area um, Right, but it, yeah, we're just going to get into the same problem, right, of, of us op trying to operate town equipment on private roads, and mm -hmm. we, that's just something we've steered clear of and actually got ourselves out of some, and we've got some more to do on that front, but I think we got to look at just what the circulation is in the equipment. And looking and at this, looks like. looking at this street map, you know, where I live, in, in you know in a residential neighborhood this actually looks like it's a lot easier to clear snow than a regular neighborhood you've only got houses on one side you know on one side of the street throughout most of the loop so this this seems like it's a, like a dream to to get rid of snow compared to what the town crew does all winter long all the time so i'm i'm really not sure why we would it's not obvious to me why this is problematic. Um, it seems like, if anything, this is much easier than what the town deals with all the time. So I, I'd really like to see us just move ahead with this and not, I, I just so don't want to jeopardize this project. It has been so many years in the making. The benefits to the town are so clearly overwhelming. Um, I, it's just, I think we just need to keep moving forward on this and make sure that this project really happens. What's the action that is needed? What's, and what's the timeline? Uh, so, well, um, well, we're not actually adopting it now anyway. Right, so just to be clear, the, the, the DRV permit had to, and had to allow for the adoption. Um, and that, they did that. Um, the select board um, is the entity that adopts roads. And so what, and, and in conversations with Trevor, he didn't feel comfortable with asking for conditional adoption, which was, you know. We won't accept something that doesn't exist. 
Right. And so honestly, it's the easiest way to think of it. I don't. Not so bad of practice. So, so what we're asking is essentially, um, and what we we're going to draft up as a part of like, wait, this is the process. We need we need to know what the engineer will cost. We need to know what who we're, who we're dealing with. We need to know as soon as possible because we can't change these plans too much, but if we're gonna change them, it has to be before we close into the entity and we and start construction. We need to know that, yes, we're all agreed, these specs meet town standards as our engineer stipulates in his memo. memo. Once that's, then we're just building to the plans. And as soon, and, and this was just to lay out that process so we all agree that this is the process and if all goes well, then at the end, we have a road that was built to the specs, and then we bring it to the town for final adoption. But um, what we didn't want to have happen is this uncertainty that lingers on, where our funders are sort of, you know, anticipating that this will happen so that it stays affordable, and, and that at the end, there's, you know, something happens that wasn't anticipated. We've built the road, and then um, there's, you know, not agreement on what happens at that point. So at this point we're asking for those for the, the agreement on the process to be able to get the engineer to stipulate that the plans do meet the the town standards and to also as Mark was saying we're going to be buying that engineer's um, time so we need a cost to put in our budget and we're going to be buying a bond to bond the work so that if something goes wrong you have the money to fix it. And in terms of deadlines, if we take time to look at the minutes of the DRB, mm -hmm. we're, trying, we're trying to close to close this by 6-1. Now we don't have to finish this by 6-1 because we won't start the construction until probably mid-June. Um, but the later it goes, the harder it gets. We're changing stuff midway. So the, just the earliest we can get to agreement, especially on, yeah, these plans meet these steps. So we know what we're building to, and we're all agreed on that. That would be the first and most important step. But knowing the prices so that we can make sure that we're you know, covered in our budget and we know what those costs are that we're incurring would be the other thing. <coughs> One, one thing you can do tonight as a select board, if you so desire, is to determine the cost uh, or determine the amount of that uh, or the terms of the surety bond. Um, again, in our land use regs, the, the language reads that the surety bond we must cover 100% of the cost of construction of the project plus a 15% contingency. The second part of that process for a surety bond is to determine the length of that bond. So traditionally, in our land use regs, we would uh, we would keep that bond through a time, the time in which the select board determines that the project is completed, and then an additional two years after that. Uh, so if there are any unintended issues that happen, like Julie said, the, sh the surety bond will protect and mitigate against those losses. The uh, you do have uh, it, the select board's prerogative. You can change the time uh, that you require that surety bond to to make to to, to, to maintain uh, protection over the project. Um, and uh, you can you can also make a determination that the contingency costs could be shifted. Uh, but generally, uh, it is. The 100% of the cost of construction, 15% contingency, two years after the project's been determined to be completed by you, the select board. If if Julie had that, that would be one additional step uh, that she can check the box in terms of covering the costs and budgeting correctly. And I think that was the uh, that was one of the one of the main points for tonight was to 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 get that portion of uh, of the need dealt with. Uh, what Julie wants to do um, in terms of getting the road adopted is in fact critical. Um, there are, it is, this is the first time you as a select board are looking at the, the kind of, uh, this, this, this particular, this, uh, the site plan, uh, the determination for 
you know, how the, the, the is going to cloud, that sort of thing. Those are all important questions. Um, but I do think that the, uh, like Larry said, this is a project that is, is extremely, <coughs> extraordinarily important for the community. Um, and it's one that just, it really does need to be done. And so um, we, we want to be as supportive as we can to, to seeing it through. Um, the, what I've seen on the other projects that are this size and scope is the costs, although we thought the costs were being contained through inflation moving lower over the past year or so, things have begun to shift again where inflation is becoming a problem again. And so any further delays could just, this, 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 this thing could just repeat itself in terms of another gap in funding. So it's just it's very important that we, we do resolve this as quick as possible for everybody's sake in our community. I agree that it's important, but I think we also need to know what we're getting into. And Certainly. I think it's also important for us to get John to the table and have a conversation because we ought to be doing this with him instead of to him. Sure. Um, yeah, I agree. And then I think it, you know, it's, it's more than that, right? There's a conversation about sidewalks. There's a conversation about, yep. and I would imagine the Water Sewer Committee should be involved in whether the town takes over all that infrastructure because that then becomes the water for the sewer districts. Yep. Those that right? the, the, we have already, like the, the agreements have, uh, the select board agreed to, to reinstate the water permits back in December of 2022. So that's sort of, it has been, it has been approved. Um, and the conversation about making sure that it can be, uh, making sure that the, the water department understands the full scope of it and has a, a thorough uh, understanding of what those allocations mean is important, um, and you know the sooner the sooner the RACDs can have those conversations with these departments, the better. I think uh, mm -hmm. Julie has uh, she's availed herself to uh, and whatever whatever works for uh, for the, the the water wastewater department to make sure that portion of the of the project they feel comfortable with it because it is it's a it's a it's a big allocation. You know, this is, I think we all need to just be like, you know, remember this is a huge project relative to what we've got going downtown. And, and Julie has another one of these on the other side of town that we're gonna be talking about fairly soon as well. And of the units that are being built in our community, these two projects represent the lion's share of what we're offering uh, to, to, uh, to try to, to try to eliminate some of the some of the challenges that we have. I did prepare a, um, to Trevor's um, guidance of uh, the cost um, that would be based, um, well, that you would base the sure you gone on for review. So I think that's available for. And that's the million dollars. No, the, I mean, it was this. It's from the ground. It's. It's from a certain place up, and I think, I don't know. But you're taking testing. out the water and the wastewater and stormwater, oh, yeah, which will all be part of it. Right? You oh, said you it. wanted us to take over the, you wanted the town to take over the water and the sewer, and the, the <clears throat> I would imagine, you know, I mean, I, that all ought to be part of the surety bond then. So um, I think these are two different things. Um, so one thing is that we, we do have, we have bonding on the project, our own bonding on the project. This was what Trevor said the guidelines for the road bond were, which is a separate bond. And so this follows Trevor's template. I don't know, he, he has to review it to make sure I did it correctly, but to my understanding, this was his guidance about what costs were included in that. I don't know. I I'd have to look at it again and look, look at the notes. notes. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to delay or be difficult. Well, I just don't. Um, for the water and sewer, so all assets then the town takes over with no surety bond that they're built, right? I'm being quoted, but I want to check my own notes to make sure. I just. And stormwater is. What is the, the stormwater is 
part of what? Is that for the entire project or is that just for the road stormwater that you took out? Uh, the stormwater is, is what we're adding. So this represents the costs, not of anything that's there already, but things that we're adding in this. For the road or for the entire project? For the entire project. Do you have a map of where those are? Where the, what type, what of the stormwater requirements from the stormwater permit? Yeah, they have, is none they of have that, the whole plan set. Is that any of that near the road? There are swales near the road, yeah. So who are you wanting to be responsible for the swales? We're responsible for the swales. You want us to push the snow and whatnot yeah, into the swales? It doesn't matter, they're designed for that. I just think there's so many under I'm not comfortable making a decision tonight on this. I just, I just don't want us to delay. I haven't seen, I, just, I don't, I don't, want us I don't to mind delay taking them. it up in May, but I think we've got to is, if we, know what if we're, we're going able into. To, if, Julie, if we made a final decision in May, is that going to, how close, I mean, is that acceptable for you or? Yeah, I mean, I, that, that is, I, I, you know, the cost I need to know, once we close those, those costs are sealed. So, I, you know, knowing the costs, knowing the surgery gone, knowing the engineer's costs and stuff is important to our budgeting. Um, so, yeah, May would be great. And knowing, you know, looking to the, the, the plan of attack and what the conditions are and things. We just need certainty um, because we, we don't, you know, once we build it, <laughs> we can't go back and unbuild it. Um, and it's an immense uh, investment for all of us. So, it's some of what you're looking for us to approve is a document that lays out the process and and what, ha what the steps are, and we don't have any of that in front of us. So, like, I'm not comfortable signing off on a process <laughs> to get through construction and what the town has to do and what you have to do. Like, I just think there's so many unknowns tonight. I think by May, we should be able to look at plans and look at more of the engineering work that was done. What does the DRV permit say? And define what parts are your responsibility versus what you're looking for the town to take over. I, again, I, if we can do it by May, that's great, um, and we'll make ourselves available to supply whatever you don't have, and to meet with whoever we need to meet with as soon as possible. We just, you know, um, obviously we want to make sure this works for everybody. Um. Okay, we had, uh, <clears throat> just identify yourself for the record. Mark Mullen, uh, I work for Gillespie, so it's right down the road from where I work every day. Um, when it comes to the snow storage, um, we don't have any in town. They actually plow the snow in front of Gillespie's and block half of Summer Street as it is. So this might actually help some of that snow go further down than blocking in front of the post office for days. So that was just my two cents. Um, I found the meeting minutes from the DRB. It's November 13th. It has some language in it, but I know it's not the only missing piece right now, but. Yeah, I know. It's one of them. <laughs> it's one of them. I did find it, so. <laughs> okay. It would be great if we can make sure that we get all our, all the materials in place that we need to by, by our May meeting so that we can really give Julian and her funders the certainty that they need to keep, keep moving forward. Um, and the, the Water Wastewater Committee has discussed this project, and it, they, we, we have plenty of water. Um, to service these units and um, and with the wastewater capacity of the wastewater treatment plant is is, is still um, we're far under like like really far under the, the, the rated capacity of that plant so this this kind of project is is, is actually not a cost to the wastewater water districts but a, a real boon because you know the more the vast majority of the costs of those systems are fixed and actually supplying water to these 
units is, is, is a marginal extra cost. And so the fees and the um, monthly, you know, fee for usage, um, the allocation fees and the fee for usage um, will, will actually help the, you know, the financial situation of those districts in a, you know, small but relatively significant way. So it'll really be, you know, just like, you know, just like this project is likely to bring in a lot more money in property taxes and it's going to cost the town to, to maintain the streets and other parts of the infrastructure, at least for the foreseeable future. I wasn't worried about capacity. It was whether the committee had discussed taking ownership of all this infrastructure. Yeah, I believe we heard from... Because usually we have a spot, and then from therein is the developer's responsibility. So I just was, like, had they discussed where that spot was? Right. Typically, there's the shutoff a few feet in from the street for the buildings, and um, I mean, I would imagine that it would be like ever any other, you know, private residence or building where the town maintains and owns up to that shutoff, and the private party owns back from there. Yeah, there's um, the actual um, the mains are the part that the town owns, and then from that shut off to you know, the, the service lines are what typically is owned and operated by the owner. And on the DRB plans, we had outlined the, the easement areas for the water mains and the sewer mains. And so they had access to review that at, at the time. Yeah, understood. I think the Water Sewer Committee, though, is the one that looks at the infrastructure. And But don't we usually own to the edge of the public? To the public right away. Right away. And then it's, um, like, we don't own I, over up against somebody's building. No, we don't own that up until, no, because usually the, cause the shutoffs are usually within the public right away. Yeah, curb stops usually the great point. I mean, that's usually inside the right away. Might be on the property, but inside the right away. Okay. So do Julie? Do you feel clear on what else we need to fit? Like, um, well, if if you need anything else, you can just ask. I, what I'd like to be a little clearer on is the time frame because. It's all and a month goes fast, and, um, and it I'm sounds like there's several steps that need to be taken here that are on we the town side. We want to look at We want to look at some of the engineering, right? I just don't. If we're gonna push it to May to talk about, I want to make sure we're not in May and still don't have what we need to make our decision. I think there's minutes. There's a. DRB decision that has language in it that says what's what and what they expect. The site plan that shows um, what they're looking at there, and uh, some conversation with John. But I think this this uh, understanding of what the process is and who does what and how it happens has to be drafted. And I also think we need to have that level of who's responsible for what defined. That's what the, that's what our board needs to take action on. Is that those two documents of what you know what the who's res, who's responsible for what and what the process is that they're going to go through to get to a decision point of whether the board accepts it or doesn't accept it. Does that feel doable? Yeah, I mean, I, ideally, we have those conversations before the meeting with the whoever wants to be part of those decisions so that there is some kind of agreement prior to the meeting that serves your purposes too I think in that you're looking for guidance we're looking for guidance if we could come to a negotiated agreement that seems to satisfy the town manager whoever on the board is going to be the representative whoever at the town you know so that we we can sort of have those discussions before the meeting and feel good about what we're proposing together I think that's the ideal way forward, if it's possible to pull that together. And I'll clear my schedule for whatever meetings need to have, you know, us there to, to discuss. And mm -hmm. our attorneys also offer to draft the document, whatever. Yeah, that will work for us. Um, the 
that's just not good practice. That's somebody else's attorney about something that we agree to. Um, we've got some homework to do, but I want to be clear. Are you expecting me to negotiate an agreement of some kind or just lay out a process? I don't. I don't there are know different that, things. Yeah. And we're talking three weeks' time uh, because we moved the meeting this month. So in three weeks, that leaves us getting our head around what this is. Um, and I understand engineers on different sides and in different roles look at this, but it really needs a reality test of can we function and, and operate here, which, and the answer may very well be yes, but it may also come back that, well, we might be able to if we had this different or that different. I think we need to give that feedback to you. And then it sounded like some of the process was already defined and you had some minutes or notes that you had, were reading from of what needed to be done. I think there is a standard for adopting, I've seen it somewhere. Um, but then I, I think you're right. I think there's a whole negotiation process over who does what, right? Like who, the topic of the, of the sidewalks came up. Who owns the sidewalks and is responsible for those? Because I think that's a, that's a conversation piece. But no, I, I think this is coming at a terrible time, especially coming out of that FEMA meeting today and whatnot. Like, we have some actual roads in Randolph right now that if we, we have to commit some serious staff time to. So I don't know, I don't know what the answer is, Trevor. I don't know how we get those done. And maybe it's, I don't know. I really don't. I'm, and we'll brief you guys on everything that went down today. But you know, I've spent, I literally have spent the last two days on road issues, and. We got some serious staff time coming up on those. I don't know. I know what we got to do. I understand you're up against the deadline, and I'm really, you know, I feel for you. But literally, the, this landing in our lap this week is hard for me to sit here tonight and say, "Oh, here's some agreements and documents," or I know exactly what's got to be written or whatever. I think we got to. I hate to give you a, t a timeline today because I don't know what it's what it's going to take to put those together. I haven't done one of these, and I don't know if anybody else has done one and wants to jump up and take the lead on it, feel free. But well, I think we've got to define what that process is and what the, what, what is, what is a, su a successful position, like what, what gets us to a yes, right? So yeah, an engineer has to look at it, but what's the engineer looking at? What do they have to have? What do we need coming out of that? There's got to be one of these out there somewhere. I mean, I think, frankly, you have most of that information already, and the road adoption process that the town has is sort of sets out the, the outlines, and we've, we've got that in our memo. It's just a matter of sort of filling in the blanks of, like who's the engineer and at what point, you know, like they ask it, how many times does the, do you want the engineer to be out on site? Those are things that are up to you. It could be just once or it could be four times or whatever. It's, that's really, you know, whatever you think is. But you're asking us to get to an estimate of that engineer's time we, we need all that. Like, we just need the engineer's rate and how many times you want to, you know, like we just need a rough estimate of time and the rate of whichever engineer you plan to use. And we really need that engineer to be able to look at the plans and, and agree that these meet the standards, right? This is something that, this is this is basic because that's what we're gonna build the road to and we need to agree early um, mm -hmm. on that. I agree with you. I, I totally get what you're saying. What I'm saying from my perspective is it's coming down to staff hours. And we've known that we were coming to this point at the town level for a while now, and we're here. Mm -hmm. We're at a point where taking on, taking on, taking on just can't happen. And 
unfortunately, it's another one of your projects when we're getting to that point of just not having the bandwidth to do it. And it, that's where the challenge is right now for me, really, is I can tell you I give a lot of hours to issues in this town, and I'm not looking to take the lead on writing this. I just can't. I, I was in, you know, what I think, I don't know. Well, and, and I understand why you might want to not want to take our attorney's draft at face value, but he has done these in other towns, and he's happy to draft something. So your you. attorney or our attorney, though? He's, I mean. That's the answer. Well. Whose attorney is it? He's our attorney right. drafting something has done before, but I'm, what I'm saying is we hand the draft over to you and your attorney, and you tell us if you like it or not. I just, if there's any way we can help make this happen, we will. And that's one way we can maybe but make Have comments. him send us some samples of what he's done in the past. It gives us a starting point, and we'll see if we can find okay. people to look at them and, and work on them. Well, I think Julie's saying that yes. she's going that she's willing to provide us with a finished document, which we could then review. And I just want to continue to make the point that this is like a generational project for Randolph. This has been so many years in the making, so much time and energy has gone into this so far. The benefits to having this project happen are really hard to overstate. And, and it might not be coming to the town at a good point. And there might be some things which could have handled, been handled better. But we're at this point now. We're at a, a junction where if, this, if we do something or not don't do something and this project doesn't happen, it's, it's just hard for me to imagine that we could risk, want to do anything to, to risk that. And, and I know that, you know, I'll just say it again, we're, we're just, here's where we are. We're, we have this amazing project, which has been years in the making, the benefits of the town, and I know I'm repeating myself, it's hard to overstate. Um, just have to we just this just has to happen we have to make sure that this that this project happens do you want to take the lead on developing these documents and and getting them ready to bring to the board in may what kind of what kind of timeline would that involve i'm you got three weeks from tonight right i'm i'm gonna i have no time to do that between now and at least at least next Friday. So you got two I could weeks. do it. I could do it a after that. I could start to do. I could start to do stuff after after Friday. I could spend the weekends. But and I'm happy to work around whatever schedule. And if you can tell me who needs to be what at what meeting when, we could even arrange the meetings. I mean, I just we don't have a lot of time either. <laughs> but um, this is kind of mission critical. So, I honestly, Larry, have no bandwidth to mm -hmm. take on another big project like this, and I don't see this as a little one. Like, there, there's a lot of pieces, parts that have to be wrangled. But, okay. We time block some stuff out, see what order we can get them in, and then maybe there are smaller pieces that people can help with, uh, in addition to the pieces that some of us are going to have to do it. So that might be the... All right, I think that's all you're getting out of us tonight, because we have a couple of I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to go too far. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Julie, uh, sure, you could start by just emailing me with a list of things that just to give me a heads up of what might be coming. And okay. so that when I start to have time to really work on at least to be able to wrap my mind, I'll have some processing time before that. Okay. And Trevor, okay. if, those other, if you all have nice. suggestions about things that I should be thinking about in, in this context, I would really appreciate it. Larry, you can copy, you can copy me too. I'm willing to put in some time. Okay. okay. I just want to clarify, like some of what we need to do, generational or not, run of the mill or not, is making sure the town's interests are always fully protected. So some of this is just through that lens. It's got nothing to do with anything else other than completely. that's the mission. So I just want to make sure that that's pretty clear. I completely understand, Trevor. I really appreciate that. 
Okay, public assembly permits. We have two of them. One is for RACDC's first Friday, and the other is the American Legion's Memorial Day Parade. Um, did anybody, do we want to take these separate, or can we have any issues with any of them anywhere? Um, I didn't see anything. I saw um, Scott signed off on. I'm Scott's on if you have any questions for him. Yeah, the parade, I saw his signature on it, but I think he spoke with Laura about First Friday stuff. Mm -hmm. And I think I remember seeing that there was money in the budget for police services to be covered, correct? Anybody have any questions or concerns about these? Okay. Um, I Anybody in the audience? And Julie, you're still planning on all those dates, the Saturdays and the Fridays? Um, or are you going to get the permit and see what happens? Yeah, I think we're at that point. And the, the Saturdays, I think, are, uh, are less likely. than we didn't do the better places, and we don't have the staffing. So unless something else happens, we that's aspirational. I thought just First Friday was actually on the list. But. Yeah, I think the permit that Laura had submitted had the Saturday still listed. So would you like to amend that to just the first Fridays? Yeah, I think so. We're not okay. planning on the Saturdays right now. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any further discussion? Scott, any issues with either of these? Uh, nope. Uh, I've had conversations with all parties, and we have worked out uh, details and plans um, with the Memorial Day Parade. And I've added my really, really brief notes uh, into that permit uh, upon sign-off. Uh, in regards to First Fridays, we already had a scheduled plan for a officer and cruiser for assisting with the blocking off versus row, so we are all good on that piece, and we'll have that officer assigned to that detail on those first Fridays. Cool. Great. Right. Anybody else? All good? Entertain a motion to approve them? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Billy. Appointments to boards, committees, and commissions. Um, we have a few committees that seem to have lost their Kind of direction and mission and one of them we have an applicant here but um i think we need to write a new charge for the energy committee we've talked about that one already and about into the rec committee um, yeah. that just kind of spells out kind of what the what the goal is what the board wants them to do before we populate them I think we got to do something to re re-energize the energy committee. <laughs> no pun intended, but kind of redirect them and get them focused on some goals to attract some people to that committee. And then on the rec side, what do we want out of that committee? We need to go and sit and like, what do we want them going for? What do we want them doing? Where do we? You know, I just saw the grant came out for her bike path. At B trans are out, and at one point we had a bike path that that group was working on. Was that energy or rec? Rec. Rec is right, yeah. And some things like that. So, like, I wonder if we need to kind of re redirect the direction for these guys and make it clear. Does that make sense? Yeah, I spoke with Morgan briefly as the new director, um, and that was one thing that we kind of talked about too. Just, just in looking back at the history of that committee, it was made in 2009. Hello. And so, uh, I, you know, like a lot has changed in the whole rec department since 2009. Like abuse sports used to never be under rec, that sort of stuff. And so now we kind of have that well established under rec. And so then, what is this group doing? It's kind of it has kind of seen the loss like meaning or mission. Well, what can they do? What can right. they help us with? Yeah, when I was sat on the rec committee, it seemed like a lot of what we did was events, volunteering and coordination, and sort of and getting events, certain types of events off the ground. And um, in fact, I was just I was just talking with Trevor the other day about this, and um, 
this is just kind of a little bit of a brainstorm, but one of the things that came up in our conversation was wondering if the, we could take that committee and maybe change its orientation just a little bit from be really, really being an, ed, more of an, an, from a, a, an advisory committee to more of like an, an events specific committee mm. that would you know come up with ideas for events, keep the current you know the current sort of roster of events that we already have going, um, kind of a, a, a clearinghouse for town wide. Events that, that take place. Mm -hmm. so people who can generate expertise over time, get some institutional knowledge going, um, and it would be like the place where, oh, someone wants to do an event. Oh, who do you go see? Ah, we have a committee for that. Um, I think in a committee for recreation is completely different for a committee for events. I think they could be two different things, or two of like the same thing, but I think, you know, the committee for rec. I mean, Morgan's doing a great job. Maybe just a committee to say, hey, this is what I'm thinking. This is what I'm doing. You know, help me figure this out. Let's work together on this. So maybe it's not all just on one person for a while. Yeah. I, I think, I oh, yeah. And I mean, I think I like the idea of a committee for events. I think that also seems to really just fall on rec. Um, but I think that may just need to be a separate entity. I think a committee. The rec committee really does need to revamp and come back. I think there's a lot of stuff that would be great to go through a committee. Yeah, I wonder if, um, I if you think a committee is, especially mm -hmm. if Morgan thinks a committee is, a rec committee is helpful and so as supportive. Um, but right now I think the rec committee is a seven member committee. I'm not sure what the, and you would all know maybe, better. Maybe it, maybe, it doesn't, yeah. maybe it doesn't need to be seven, maybe it should be Especially if it's an advisory committee. I think it is right? seven, but it might five charge. might be a magic number. Yeah. Magic is there any way to charge know. set the number of people? I think the rec, the feedback for the rec program could actually be part of a bigger events, right? You're looking at ways to involve the youth and, and adults in, in physical activities and sports and whatever. You're also looking at ways to get people into the downtown to participate in yes. the tree lighting yeah. or the Halloween thing or whatnot. And the rec director used to be involved in a lot of yeah. that stuff mm -hmm. from time so, to time. So it's so it could be that the rec committee is, we would just sort of give them a more formal charge as you're also yeah. you know, I think that's what be helpful with the, with the events, yeah. where, which they used to do, but now it would be more of a intentional. It was more there before, it was more like kind of happened by default. Um, and then if we look at who's on the energy committee? Alyssa. <laughs> <laughs> She's on the rec. Is that you? Uh, I'm on rec, yep. Rec there is, oh, sorry. Oh, as far as select board thing. Let me know once we're yeah. And we're talking about board members right now. Um, just got some miles, just I have the list up. Of board members? I do too. There's oh. five. No, I meant for the rec. No, I meant for the rec advisory committee. Sorry. Um, we have the the newest one we wrote was the police services committee. And the draft of kind of how to of a charge. Um, so we kind of define rec, the rec or public community involvement or whatever we want to call that. But what do we want out of the energy committee? Yeah, there's there's some good guidelines out there. I think I sent you that that link right on about about town energy committees, because um, most towns have do have energy committees, and um, it's a pretty well established like this is what you do. This is kind of what you do. Thing. Yeah. Um, well, and I wonder, I wonder with Jeff, with the new position, would it be to help kind of be a sounding board for projects or you know, before it could be. I mean that's a new position. Come, right? We're still yeah. holding that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe then it like yeah, could be like a sounding board before it comes to the select board. I think I think I recall there being some expectation that Jeff would, would, would sure. be able to help <laughs> this from time to time, depending upon what he's got going on. Yeah, right. Somewhere I've got a list of projects that we had assigned the Energy Committee last day. I had to do a building audit and, right and whatnot. <laughs> um, and, yeah. 
And, and, and you know, from what I, I can tell, my you know, <laughs> also from what I could tell from from sort of my own my own sort of past history with the energy committee, and from what I've heard about it, you know, sort of in a more general sense, is that you know it's it's an all volunteer committee, so it's going to attract people who are interested in broadly those you know, any, any, you know issues issues around energy efficiency. Um, but one of the nice things about that kind of a board is that depending upon who you get on your committee. It's going to sort of inform what kind of projects you take on, right? So, if you have people who are really interested in, I don't know, I won't be able to think of anything off the top of my head, but blah blah blah, then that's maybe what you do because there's energy behind that because people are interested in it. Um, and given that it's a volunteer board, that that seems like maybe that's, you know, we kind of have broad parameters. What do energy committees do? But then within that, give them a lot of flexibility in terms of making it work for the people who happen to be on board. So, um, if you can find the sort of outline that Larry sent, that will give a good place to start to write a charge for that committee. Mm -hmm. And I can send you the format we use for the police committee, so you can see kind of what we put in that. That was an easy one because it was a pretty defined mm -hmm. sort of scope, but that will give you some idea. You're going to be looking for one that's going to have a longer shelf life, but we can help with that. Okay. So I know you applied for rec, but hold that seat. Once we rewrite the charge, then you can decide if you really want to do it or not. <laughs> can, I, can I add something just briefly? Is that I haven't had a chance to address any of you either as the rec director, so you're the chair. I'm asking you yeah, to speak. So yes, I think it's really important that we uh, maintain the Recreation Committee, and I think you all are correct in everything you've said. I did participate on the Rec, rec Committee under Heidi, and I've seen the development and change of recreation in Randolph for 25 more conscious years than 31. But um, I think it's really important. One, for events, I did participate with all of the, the kind of triangle of Fourth of July, Halloween, Winter Lights, and I was really the one sole person, and Heidi made those so vibrant because of the committee members she had. And um, I think she was very much more uh, oversight in her own seat of the sports, uh, but I think there's a great opportunity to expand representation of all the different rec opportunities, like whether it be five to ten kind of folks, five officially, um, but allow loose members to participate and have it be that participatory committee of um, yeah, because it's a lot for one person in the department and bringing people's ideas to the table, especially those that really help with the youth programming in the sports uh, as well as adults. Uh, Heidi had a really good committee of folks that represented little bits around town, so I think if we could reestablish that, um, you know, Kristen Chandler was the adult tennis person, so there's, there's some good crossover. And I work closely with Scott, so the event side of it does play in really well um, and work with all the events that are existing plus the opportunity for ones that people want to see come back, but I can't do it alone. So just that's kind of my plea for maintaining that energy. I also participated in that committee at some point. I am a tech nerd, and I think that's a great thing, but they really do need to have a task and an outline for what their purpose is if they are a town committee. Um, otherwise, I know other towns, I've worked with energy committees in other towns, and they aren't always uh, an actual town committee. They're kind of more like the bike walk group that is kind of their own um, interest, you know, whatever they bring to the table for activities. So there's two ways to go with that one, I think. But it should should have a better scope of work than maybe what it has had in the past. That's all. Just identify yourself for the record. Sure. I'm. I'm Valerie Schoolcraft. I helped serve with Heidi on the Rec Committee from 2019 to 2021, and Morgan certainly was very helpful during that time as well. And I just wanted to shed very quickly some light. Um, Heidi worked quite a bit on sports, and I helped probably about 30 hours a week with events, and Paul Ray additionally helped with his time probably another 15 to 20 hours just to give you guys an idea of the kind of time commitment it takes to pull off just one event. The Winter Lights Parade usually costs between $1,000 to $1,500 
and the egg hunt that Heidi used to do was about 500 to 700 just to give you a budget as well. And a lot of that was done through sponsorships that we went out and collected. Um, and so that was part of that time that it took. So just, I wanna make sure that the events were great. They were so fun. But I also wanna make sure that Morgan doesn't get spread too thin, which is what ended up happening to Heidi too. So just wanted to throw that out there for consideration. We also had um, Dan DeVoe, who I think we put back onto the BRB. You put him back on pending and, and then we confirm. Said yep. that said, I'm game. Um, but we also have uh, Chris, and is it Gunnell or Gunnell? Gunnell, yeah. Oh, that's you? That's me. <laughs> so. um, interested in joining the DRB. I think it will. Yeah, actually. Yeah. It's five, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So we have five and no alternatives. Don't you have so got four and no real alternative. There was box. So there might have been one person who serves an alternate, but. Alternate. Okay. Anybody have any questions for Chris? He even went to a meeting and still wants to do it. So just to <laughs> <laughs> he has dis yeah, he has displayed fortitude. That's he lasted through the whole meeting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, for punishment, I did it for yeah. almost 20 years. I've been to boring meetings. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of which, um. no. <laughs> any questions? Um, do we need a, a motion to add him since we haven't done the whole list? To appoint him to the DRB? Yeah. So it's separate? As if it were an out of cycle appointment or a mid year appointment. Yeah, no, it's okay. Um, so we did already cover Dan then with our. Yeah, he's already on. He just had to submit an email to confirm he wanted to. <laughs> It's a very moving email, by the way, Dan. <laughs> um, I will make a motion to add Chris Gunnell to the DRB. One second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Congratulations. Enjoy, guys. Thank you. <laughs> Next up is to discuss Town Clerk Treasurer Vacancy, a short and long term option. Figured with the impending end of days here tomorrow, we would update you on where we're at. Um, in the short term, Emory will likely appoint a slate of assistant clerk treasurers and we'll try to peel off different pieces um, for those folks, provide a little extra capacity, the things that people might take on might be sort of within their departmental scope anyway. So certain things that might be treasurer's duties if we, those can be taken on by folks in finance, for example, maintain appropriate controls, we'll do that. Um, we'll also try to be sort of mindful of Mary's capacity. We're looking at maybe for at least a, a short term trying to set some reduced hours, um, make sure that we advertise those so that there's some set hours, overlay and some help with stuff like land records and other things. Achieve that we might try to do the many hands make light work sort of tactic. Um, and in the longer term, we have one applicant. There's a second potential applicant. I'll know more tomorrow. <clears throat> and so I was hoping you'd be amenable to, from a process standpoint, so if we do have one or two, maybe at some point next week or thereabouts, we have two of you serve on basically a little sort of hiring evaluation committee, and you can sit on that with, say, Mary, the assistant clerk treasurer, Mimi, because the Lister's office has a lot of overlap and interplay, and then probably Kayla and Zoe from finance as well, and then possibly Judy and I. I mean, I'm, I think I'll be in there just as a facilitator, but I have Judy just as another set of ears. Um, and that way we can look at whoever we've got, and you can figure out if it's someone you want to make a recommendation to the board, if you have a tie between candidates, if there's something you need to do. 
then we, maybe we could move it toward a process after that. Because um, this follows a little bit what we talked about at town meeting in terms of perhaps what the process might be, would people be involved? So we're again incorporating some of those elements into the appointment process. So the ideal would be that any short-term solutions, we can minimize the duration of those and then move towards sort of full-time stuff. It is much like before Emory decided to do us a solid and run again and cover at least some of that time, nobody's banging down the door to, to get to this. And by sticking with the elected clerk treasurer rather than moving to the appointment, your applicant moves Randolph. That's it. That's sort of the whole nugget. Um, so what was a pretty shallow pool, in terms of just the number of people who do this stuff or would be interested in this, is as shallow as it could be, really. Um, it's just our borders. We're not super populous, so um, that's a little bit of a challenge, too. So it might be if you've got a couple of candidates, take them in. If for some reason neither works, then you've got a process established. We can continue to work. It fits what we told the community we try to do and make it work for as long as we can. There will probably in all likelihood be disruptions in service. We try to minimize those to the extent possible. We try to provide alternatives, so like vital records. You can go now to any clerk's office in Vermont and get those. And so our neighbors might see a little increased traffic if for some reason somebody's birth, death, marriage type stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, marriage license you gotta get here, right, if you live here? No. Or you can do that it, now. It changed as of last year. Perfect, that got even easier too. So there will be disruptive, you may get calls, we'll try to minimize that, but that's, and that's the nature of the beast a little bit. Um, that's what they wanted. Unlike other <laughs> positions, we don't have as much flexibility or latitude to fill the gaps with attempts from a temp agency, say, you know, some of those things. We've, we're kind of pinned in a little bit to the number the clerk treasurer can appoint, and that's a deal that's good to tomorrow. So you need two people that are available next week. Yeah, I was in. thinking next week just so we can keep moving forward. I don't wanna, if we can minimize whatever gap we've got, that would be ideal, but. I can be available during the days next week, so I'm flexible schedule. We can set them up hybrid, so you're in Cancun. Need to get out of the sun for an hour or something. Which sounds like you know, sounds like you're <laughs> You're having a hard time sleeping. The sun's shining through the window, maybe. Yeah. That's just your lamp. <laughs> it doesn't have to be two. It could just be one. The idea with two is that it's less than you would trigger any of the public meeting requirements, but provides an extra set of eyes and ears. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. 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 If I can do it by video, I can do it. They're not going to be long, right? The first one is just sort of to express, right. explain the position. And yeah, in each case, I'll have had sort of an initial conversation about some of the roles and responsibilities, and in one candidate's case, they got to talk to Emory, and I'd be able to arrange that. But again, since he's not moving to Mars or anything, but okay. maybe not. He's just Hard to pin down. When he gets when he gets moving, moves pretty fast. Um, Don't blame you. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, Chandler Preservation Trust easement. So we have a few different folks that can speak to what this is. Mark's still on. Um, he's got a couple of different hats he could potentially wear in this on both. Our staff is on the Chandler board. I see Chloe. I'm guessing you're with the Chandler folks too, but I, am, yeah. I don't know who I apologize. I don't That's know. fine. We haven't met. I'm Andy Mueller. I'm on the board of Chandler. Yeah, and so Andy Mueller. So they can take you through what this is, what they're trying to do with it. Um, I noted in the report to you guys that we've sent it to the town attorney for review. Um, with any of these long lasting easements, this one has a time limit to it. Um, but when we get to one for the library for a similar grant, similar entity, that's a forever one. So we just want to make sure that our attorney has seen it, identified if there's any issues with it. So it's a best practice. So these have all been in Mike Tarrant's hands for a couple of weeks. I don't have that feedback back yet. So in terms of action, um, I don't know that we're necessarily there, but there's a chance to talk about what it is, why they're after it, how it all fits together. 
Well, I can speak to it. I'm Chloe Powell, the director of Chandler. Um, so we've been working with the Preservation Trust. Um, we received significant funds from them to support the renovations, which was the plaster work and the restoration of the painting. Um, we have been reimbursed for most of those funds. There's one final payment. Um, and um, one stipulation of the final payment is, is that we enter a conservation easement for 15 years. Um, and really, uh, none of the things that they're requesting we don't change or anything that anyone on the Chandler board would be interested in changing. Um, it's mostly just about keeping the historic nature of the building. Um, I did express the one um, upcoming need, which is the leak in the roof, which is temporarily patched. Um, and the, the trust wants to support, um, wants to support us to, uh, well, first to start with supporting an assessment, um, but um, has expressed interest in continuing to support with future repairs and needs. So. Um, we, the board, all looked at it before we passed it along, and there was nothing really, uh, aside from reassurance that they, they want to continue to support any of upcoming um, big repairs, there was no big red flags. Um, I know there was an easement that was declined in the past that was uh, in perpetuity. Uh, this is 15 years, so um, there's really no huge needs in terms of renovations. Uh, that would be outside of what they're asking. So we're happy to answer questions. In here it talks about, and again, I like breeze through this today, so I haven't had a chance to go through, but it talks about um, mandating certain levels of um, the structural soundness, the of renovations, or not renovations, but maintenance and whatnot, and it lumps us in with Chandler as one entity that's responsible to do it all. Um, how do you see that playing out? Um, I'd be interested in hearing the specific language that you're referring to, because I haven't read that in a couple of weeks. I haven't read it for about Right, right. And I want to kind of breeze through it, but there was a part that talked about it talked about the grant tours being responsible to maintain everything in the exact like in the condition it's in today. And I just wondered how you saw that playing out because it lumped us both in as grant tour. Um, do you want me to oh, yeah, speak to that? So the. I mean, that's sort of the tip of a larger iceberg in terms of the relationship between uh, the Chandler Center for the Arts and the owners of the building, the town of Randolph. But uh, we've been in a relationship around the maintenance of the building uh, for a long time at this point. And in the lease agreement, it talks about major repairs and minor repairs. What we're looking at in terms of the uh, maintenance of the facades of the building, which is what the easement speaks about. Uh, you know, the interior and exterior surfaces of the walls of certain areas of the building is really what they're, you know, what they're getting at. Um, those are things that, that the Chandler Center for the Arts in general has, you know, as an organization has been responsible for. Um, the, Chloe mentioned the issue of the leaking roof because that is one that tips over into potentially quite a major repair. But it's still a partnership between the town and the organization in terms of repairing the roof and maintaining the structural soundness of everything underneath it. So uh, I don't think that the easement asks us to do anything that we're not already doing. And I think that uh, I speak for myself and, and significantly I think for the board as well of wanting to improve our a uh, sense of collaboration with the select board around uh, mutual understanding of, of what the process for those things moving forward would be. So, you know, determination of who's going to do what is important. This easement doesn't make it any more important, but it is an important issue that we need to speak about. Yeah, and so if you want to paint anything on the interior, you have to go get their permission? 
to paint it? Is that no? If we wanted to paint it, I joke that after 15 years, I'm gonna paint it magenta. But no, if we were to do anything that's outside of the, we just restored the painting as it was, um, and we worked with a painter that they recommended as a, a specialist in historic restoration. So if we wanted to do anything that was outside of what the historic nature of the building is, then we would have to talk to them. Um, but as I said, we don't have any intention to do that. Um, and if this only affects the, the entry area and the, the music hall itself, there's a lot of that building that's not stipulated in this easement. It's really the the uh, the exterior and the interior and that sort of where you first walk in on the music hall itself that's delineated in the uh, appendices and, and sort of descriptions and so on. And the gallery so, and woodwork and I don't think the gallery is okay. Yeah. I don't believe the gallery is part of it. Oh. That's it's just, you know of the specifically of the easement. It's not mentioned in the in the language in the easement. Um, you know, the upper gallery, the kitchen, the, you know, the, the office spaces, none of those th things, you know, if Chloe wants to paint her office, go right ahead. But the easement can, you know, is a control on, on a subset of the structure, including the, the main hall. So Andy's referencing a little bit of Schedule B, I think, just clarifies it a little bit, and then it specifies what the significant features are in the three primary spaces they're in. Or not in, I guess, the exteriors, not inside anything. All right. Exterior entrance foyer, foyer. Is it foyer or foyer? I think either. It's a so fancy one to be. Foyer or <laughs> as hard as possible. Oh yeah. Uh, main, in the main theater space. And then all the twelve and thirteen. Mm -hmm. And you said this is down to the. Oh, yeah, this is in Mike Terrence's hands, and we'll check in with him, see where we're at. We've got, a, got one for a grant for the library as well. Um, that's in circulation, and a few other things. Is that through the same entity? Both, they're both PVT. But they want a forever one. That one's a little different. It's a higher dollar amount, but it's more of a forever, and it covers everything. That's the way it's written. Do they want to own these buildings? You can ask. <laughs> I, you know, they want to preserve them in forever and put their money into preserving them and whatnot. I, I think that's a great opportunity for them. May I say something? <laughs> <laughs> no, that was a sarcastic comment. <laughs> the speaking, I'm, I'm going to put my board president add on from Chandler. Uh, our our relationship with PTV. Uh, they're a very highly valued partner that we hope to build on over over the next few years. Um, the, the cost of maintaining a building, the size and scope of, of Chandler is insane. You all know this. Um, they've, they've been very, uh, very open about their willingness to continue to support us, um, including help, uh, as Chloe stated, and Andy may have as well, on the cost of repairing the roof. Um, the, they've already uh, given us the names of a, of a good roofer to come do a full assessment. Um, they've offered to pay part of that. Um, and I, I do believe that um, the looking at this from strictly a cost standpoint for both Chandler and the town, um, the, the better relationship that we have with PTV, uh, we all win. And the, the, 15, the, the, the price to pay for that is is the easement uh, that I mean? That's really what it comes down to from a from a numbers game. So, I have one further comment. Um, the money that is involved in this easement was through Preservation Trust of Vermont. The source of the funds requires the easement. Um, that was for the initial plaster work, the repairs to the plaster. That work's been completed. Uh, and and paid for and the reimbursement has is largely already you know been been worked into our budget so uh the there's a there's an additional 
once the easement is signed, there's an additional, I think it's ten or $12,000 that's due in that reimbursement, and that'll be really helpful. If the easement wasn't signed, it would be not just a question of, uh, oh shoot, well we don't get to do that work. It would be a question of now we have to come up with something like forty or fifty thousand dollars. We have to give back to the preservation trust because their funding source for those particular monies was not uh, was contingent on the easement. That's a little bit of an awkward thing to say, but it's it's where we sit. Um, there has been a lot of other money from Preservation Trust and other private donors, I mean, well over $100,000 in the last year, that's gone to further improvements to the music hall, including painting the over the plaster work, uh, improvements to the sound system, and so on and so forth. All of that sort of stacks on to the plaster work that was done as a sort of a basic, okay, we got to get these, you know, the cracks in the walls addressed, and so on. So there's a, there's a lot to us. The stakes are fairly high for Chandler. Uh, in terms of seeing the easement signed, and I think the exposure to the town is very low, and our commitment to ongoing uh, collaboration on the maintenance of the building is 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 strong, and I hope it would, can just get stronger. So, if, I don't, if there are any I questions would about that, that, I the language know. in this is negotiable with them. This isn't We've, a take it or leave it, right? There's already been some negotiation around that in that there we made as the Chandler board made edits to the original language. Most of our edits were just kind of uh, detail-y things, making sure that, that the language was clear, because there were, you know, these things get cut and pasted, and there was some weird language in there. But, uh, I mean, you can speak more than I can about the, their, where we sit with it, but obviously, if there's, if there's a variation on it that meets their approval, then that will work. Well, I have another lawyer that doesn't edit a document that gets put in front of them, so I can't imagine there's right. going to be a yeah. carte blanche sign-in. Right. <laughs> Understood. Okay. Any other questions on this one? I have no questions, but I just I would I would like to thank the Chandler board and the director for all their really great work on the hall. I was just in the hall last weekend, and it is really beautiful. It's looking good. It's the 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 change is really. Um, in one sense, it's dramatic. But in the other sense, it's like it looks like it did before, but the way it should have looked, you know, instead. Yeah. And yeah. Mm -hmm. it's just a very, it was very nice to be in there. And the new sound system is remarkable. Mm -hmm. And um, and just the fact that you're really nurturing this this relationship with the Preservation Trust of Vermont um, is great for Chandler. It's great for the town. And I'm just so thrilled that that's going so well. So thank you so much. Thank you. Mary. Thank you. All right. Next up is NEP DEC ARPA. This is New England Precision Department of Environmental Conservation ARPA grant draft amendment. So this will be Mark again. <laughs> take you through the background. I think I've been looking on Ashley Hellman is from DEC and has been involved in this project forever too. So if you have any questions, for them. but Mark can give you the overview of what this is and why we're here. Okay. Uh, thanks, Trevor. This is an amendment to the existing grant agreement uh, with any team decision. Um, and the, the scope of the work is a wastewater pretreatment uh, design and construction at NEP. Uh, the reason for the amendment uh, is to correct some, some administrative errors and omissions uh, and provide an update uh, to a couple uh, of the sections. Um, the, uh, and we, as Trevor said, we have actually come here who, who's responsible for uh, managing this project from the DEC to the environmental analyst. Uh, but the, the, the gist here is the scope of the work to be performed um, has shifted a bit. Um, and the reason why, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, actually, um, was they, uh, the testing that was put into the original grant agreement is not applicable to any uh, It was done uh, in error, in fact. Uh, so it had the wrong metals uh, that were going to be uh, tested. So it was a matter of making the correction. So uh, so AEP will be in fact testing the correct metals. Uh, so that is part one. Um, and the remaining, uh, the, the, the big notable uh, changes are uh, the 
We're going to 90% uh, for the completed basis of design of the wastewater pretreatment analysis at, from 100%. Uh, and the reason why it gives NEP an opportunity to make amendments uh, and to, and to re, re, uh, resubmit that final completed design. Uh, and Ashley, you can nod if that's correct. Um, yes, excellent. Uh, so the, the essence of uh, this, this amendment is for those two things. Uh, there's some additional language uh, in we, we've taken great care, uh, the town manager has taken great care to establish a sub-grant agreement um, that makes it very clear that the town of Randolph is a uh, conduit of this grant um, and plays a very limited role and capacity to make sure that we're in, that, that NEP is in compliance. Um, um, so the next section that is going to be adjusted sort of spells out uh, who's responsible for um, a couple of little details, uh, which is, um, if, I, if I get this correctly, um, this is part H, uh, Ashley, um, and it's ensuring that the plan of operations is addressing uh, the following. Uh, the way it reads is uh, who, how the sub awardee will inform the municipality prior to the new system coming online. And what, I, what I'm recommending is that we add uh, some language in the sub grant agreement um, and an iteration of that was sent to Trevor today um, for your consideration to, to spell out uh, that it is in fact NEP that's responsible for, uh, for that um, and sort of ties into the fact that all, this whole section of part H31 is it's really all NEP's responsibility to do and it would go in the section in our sub-agreement that spells out what NEP's responsibilities are versus what the town of Randolph's responsibilities are. And the, uh, the other aspects of the amendment, and if you have questions specifically, Ashley can address them, but the, it, it's really about compliance and the way the reporting is going to, uh, for the deliverables from NEP to, to, to Ashley at, uh, at DEC. And some of those amendments, again, goes back to the fact that the, uh, the, the established numbers and testing wasn't applicable to any piece so they needed to be adjusted um, and the uh, the final section is in, in, in addition it's called J which is really uh, just if I make sure I get this correct it is J is a, a template uh, for it's essentially a report form that was added to uh, to the, that's being added to the agreement, which is used by NEP and it's reporting to, uh, uh, well, to us, but we, we are, we've established the, uh, the way communication goes essentially from NEP. We are the conduit. It runs to Ashley and her team um, as our responsibility, uh, which is uh, to make sure they remain in compliant. We, we, I see, um, it's my job to make sure that all this information is flowing correctly and satisfying Ashley and her team at the DPC. Um, so this part J, um, again, any little adjustment to the grant agreement requires an amendment. So it's simply just adding this, this section onto that said agreement. So I think, I think that's it. Ashley, did I miss anything? No, that was, that was great. Um, I would say that um, within, but there's a chance that this will get amended again. Uh, should I go into that right now or, or should I wait? Uh, well, you can, yes, absolutely. Thank you. But right now, NEP has given us what we call bench top testing, which is to say testing on how the metals will be collected, will, will flock together and be collected but it's in a small scale and they haven't done a full scale pilot. Right now in the grant agreement we have that they're going to give us a full scale pilot. We're looking at their bench top data now to see if that's sufficient to prove to us that they can just scale it up and therefore not have to commit to a full scale pilot but rather just commit to the full scale project. So if it were to be amended, if we were to add more to the amendment, it would just be taken out that pilot project requirement. It would not be adding anything in. 
Is that another amendment that would come after we do this one? Or are you asking to change it again before the board accepts it? Either. I like it. It's, it's my recommendation that we, we uh, you, you are open to uh, your you, you opportunity <coughs> on this, uh, and, but we hold off uh, and we wait until we hear back from the DEC on whether they're going to be requiring that additional component, at which point we will then agree to the terms of the, the final uh, uh, amendments. Uh, but the, the objective here tonight is for you to understand the scope of what this is. This also buys us a little time to make sure we get the language correct in our subgrant agreement uh, with, uh, with NEP. Uh, but it also gives you an opportunity to ask any specific questions you might have uh, due to the complexity of what this pre-treatment design and construction is. As, as, as much as I try to understand it all, there's a, you know, there's a, there's, there's a lot of moving parts in this uh, in this project so you know now is the time for you to ask some questions if you have them with ashley uh, i'm sure either ashley or her a team member would be happy to come back uh another time if there are additional questions or we can you know we can you know very easily communicate by email um but this is an opportunity to to ask a little more specific questions that you might have So Mark, from a process perspective, I would like to see NEP sign off on their uh, revised agreement before we sign off on the state revised agreement. Excellent. You um, can do that. If we're a conduit That's for this, I'd like to see them on the hook first. Yep. That that's uh, that's possible, but I think we just have to understand what the. I want to make sure that you understand what the what the amendment is, um, and so we, once we do get that. We can sort of move this progression through, you know, the is, is that is that fair? That's fair. Has the changes that Ashley's asking for been shared with them? Do they realize yes, they that have. this is the change that's coming, and they're fine yes, with we've it? Yes, we've had two. We've had two meetings uh, uh, regarding the amendment uh, and the changes, and all parties are well. NEP is uh, perfectly willing to adhere to. The new terms. And we require that of them, right? That they have to yes. comply with our agreement. That's correct. Our grant agreement with the state, too, right? Yes. As Mark, as Mark said, the there was an initial error by uh, by us uh, regarding which pollutants were to be monitored and and measured in the grant agreement and what happened is it this grant agreement kind of got fused with another grant agreement and so the pollutants that we were asking for were never what NEP you measured for were never NEP was always going to measure the ones that are in this amendment that if this is just correcting that error Um. Does the select board or uh, Trevor have any any questions uh, now that could possibly be answered uh, by by Ashley? Um, and if, if not, it sounds like we 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 finalized our draft on the subgrant agreement, and given that uh, NEP is going to sign that we'll get that signed we'll wait uh for uh ashley to get back to me regarding the uh, additional potential uh to add to this uh if and uh and we can we can we can perhaps table this until the may meeting does that sound does that sound fair uh, i think it does Thanks for waiting that one Thank out. Thank you. <laughs> Exciting business on the town of Randolph. 
Hey, I like the Chandler. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Thank you. Is that your last one, Mark? Uh, no, I want uh, the uh, MP1 for uh, the Playhouse. Uh, I will remain. I can handle that one for you if you do want to go. Oh. That's fairly standard. That case? <laughs> well, I'm actually like, oh, wow. He's going to be excited or feel like Unless you guys actually have questions or feel rowdy about it, in which case he's got to stay, but if it's peaceful. Yeah. Are you guys okay with that one? That's pretty straightforward. Uh, if you're good, I may back out, actually. All right. When we get there, it's very. We can call you if we have a challenge. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds good. I've got myself Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Mark. Okay. Take care. Sidewalk Master Planning Grant. I'll start with that one. I agreed to work with the Bike Walk Randolph group, but I haven't spent a whole lot of time, so I'll just give a, a basic introduction to it, and then I think Mary Ann can help with the, mm -hmm. any details or any questions. But it's really not a grant. Um, mm -hmm. T. Rourke has funding to um, help towns work on their bike on their um, bike walk master plan or sidewalk master plan and they basically do the work they have a process they follow where they do a survey um, they're working with two towns right now which is us and Hartford and they basically write the grant I think I mean you can yeah they really they wrong, really do they, everything. they do all yeah, the work they do no a cost. survey with the residents they pay to mm -hmm. um, have a meeting with the town it's with as many people that are interested to give input and the real interesting thing to me is with the survey they have a grant that will actually pay um, certain people with income qualifications to take the survey and that they're focusing on trying to get the um, people that might not usually take a survey or the um, underprivileged people to really get the focus on what they would like to see or if it's meeting their needs in the town so um, I think that had a kind of a short window, but so I, I don't know if you know if that was still I available, but I think it is. I think of Health. I think it was stipends to encourage people to come right. to the public meeting and offer input right. so, to two rivers. Sure. So the bottom line is what it will, what the town will end up with is a master plan, a sidewalk master plan that will just help get other grant funding. But this one really doesn't cost the town. Um, there's no cost to the town whatsoever. There's some volunteer time and mostly done by the bike walk group that can report back with the findings that they, they get. And of course the draft um, the T work delivers after collecting the information will be you know brought in for approval. Does this look so. at the entire town? I there there's a, yeah. a scope scope of work that I, I think Trevor probably has. Um, there have been meetings. So I'm the co-chair of the group. John Kaplan is the other co-chair. And he's met with, um, I think, Jeff, you were at some of those meetings, and Rita from Two Rivers. So it's actually a walking and, and cycling master plan. These are um, big projects. And um, Two Rivers ha had funds this fiscal year to assist Randolph in doing this master planning. And they're also helping, um, I think it's Hartford rewrite it is Hartford, yeah. But there's no cost to the town. Um, it will just provide short-term, intermediate-term, and long-term goals on biking and walking infrastructure. There's no commitment to any of that. It's just, it's just really a planning document. Yeah, it focuses on existing sidewalks that might need some um, renovations and it, it is town-wide, and they're, at least they're trying to get people you know, from around the town. There's not mm -hmm. a lot of sidewalks in the other villages. Um, they're mostly here, but you know, part of the survey could be, I'm not 100% sure it is, but where the areas are outside of the village itself where sidewalks would be beneficial. But um, I'm almost thinking like that strip along Randolph Center for the college yeah, up in that area. Talked but, about, they talked about yeah. doing it in East Randolph down 14, but there's mm. not enough right away there. And mm. when they realized they'd have to take the front steps off the building <laughs> that used to be the old green store down there, yeah. they, that kind of got lost. But yeah. um, they have looked at it down yeah. there. In, in, yeah, and we do have a sidewalk inventory that Josh gave me. I'm not sure if you've seen that, but 
it's, I haven't looked at it in a while, but we'll make sure that that kind of comes into play as well with what work's already done. Mm -hmm. um, they, they're really focusing, I think, on people that pretty much do a lot of walking in the village or want to do more, which is a lot of the elderly at the um, elderly housing that we have around the town. So. I think it's important if we're going to do this plan that it cover the whole town, though, because yep, we constantly get hammered mm -hmm. that we are only doing the village. Yeah, it should cover the town, um, and my understanding is that they're looking at at least the center of Randolph Center and, and East Randolph, the village area. So they would be looking at that from a planning perspective and making recommendations that the town can agree or disagree with and do whatever they want with them. Um, but it's really a great opportunity because it's my understanding that these are really expensive kinds of projects if, we, if the town was just gonna go out and hire somebody to do a master plan of this type. So um, we were selected. <laughs> as one of the towns to have this done this year. And the survey is actually pretty much done. And um, the public meeting we're hoping to have on May 7th at the Randolph House. So if anybody has questions about that, does it sound good? <laughs> is that the only public meeting you're having? Is it the um, there probably could be more. I'm not really that familiar with these. I think that's good input. I think we should, I think we could would be open probably to that. Do more. Is to have one maybe up in Randolph Center and maybe have one down in the village of East Randolph. Are there any sidewalks down there now at all? None. None, yeah. It's been a lot of talk about it. I, yeah. I, my word, I can remember for years they've had the conversation, but it's never come, they've never done anything. We just yeah. walk in the road. Yeah. You, you still can. For the granite trucks to go by and like move you around a little. No, really. It's a wonderful thing. Yeah, wonderful, yeah. Every now and then you see somebody who's got their kid on the wrong side, you know, like take the kid to the safe shoulder and you take the outside of the road oh my God. and stop yeah. and had conversations with them before. But um Yeah. I at least some type of outreach to try to get the survey over there to people at least and sure. and yeah. make sure that it's included yeah, would be good. Yeah, about um, maybe having um, a second meeting at the community hall down there or maybe someplace uh, separate. Wait until we hear what the fire marshal says about you. Because that's a process underway. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe the fire, the, fleet, the fire station. Is that based on that? Yeah. Okay. So the timeline is to have this done by the end of September. <coughs> These are funds that we need to use this fiscal year, is my understanding. So this is something that will happen relatively quickly. The federal fiscal year. Pardon? The federal fiscal year. Yeah, it must be the federal. Those are their uh, federal highway planning funds. They go okay, the yeah. Federal calendar year. So okay. September 30th. Okay. So any questions? Do you, need, do you need the town to agree to this? So my understanding that the town has, <laughs> through John, he couldn't be here tonight, so John's I wasn't at that meeting. John did not agree to this without the board agreeing to it. The master plan will certainly be, um, you know, approved by the select board, but as far as the other activities they're doing, uh, yeah, we. I mean, you should definitely be aware. We, we've talked about it. A little bit, and I'm kind of, you know, the. If you can bless the effort, that's the safest thing to do. So just. I yeah, think before we take any it. grant funds or do any planning project, right. it ought to be blessed. Absolutely. By the board. Yeah. Yeah. That would be great. I don't think you want to be out there on your own mm. with a no. plan like that, trying to commit the town to. Oh, no, no. 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 Whatnot in a plan. Yeah. Yikes. Okay. Anybody want to make a motion to. But the grant is what are we not doing? ours. Well, the Something funding counts. isn't, but yeah. the project is. So it just means yeah. to approve participation even would be, mm -hmm. I think, okay. fine. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, discuss a draft volunteer policy, including background checks. Yep, so we've been working on this. Judy's been doing a good job pulling 
what examples we can find together, just trying to draft one up. We've been trying to stitch together the different pieces. Um, this would essentially cover everybody. We likely even could extend it to employees. We weren't set up with VCIC, which is the Criminal Information Center, um, to run these outside of, say, Scott's shop, you know, through their law enforcement capabilities, but we're now um, signed up for that and uh, have a sense of cost, so we can start to run those. So it'll be everybody from referees to coaches, anybody who's a volunteer with us, especially if they're going to encounter vulnerable populations. Those are pretty well drawn out in statute, so um, folks of a certain age group, you know, whether they be sort of on the older end or children uh, or other categories of, of folks. So this will be firemen? Um, firemen will go through this policy, it'll be Program. If the energy committee is going to go into households to do energy audits or things like that, we want them covered. So we'll try to spell out who, who will need one and under what sort of condition, and then we're able to run those. Um, one thing that. We develop forms and all of that, so that it's, a, it's a pretty formalized process. We make sure we protect personal information, those types mm -hmm. of things. The one thing you and I talked about was I, I coach for Central Vermont, and we actually have to go through, in order for the Vermont Soccer Association to accept us as coaches, every year we have to go through GOT sport training, mm -hmm. which is vulnerable population. It's a um, result of the Nasser sexual assault against all the gymnastics women. Um, it kind of came out of that legislation. Um, but it's, it's being able to spot predators and sexual like things happening before it happens sort of a thing. And it might be something even if we don't do it for all the volunteers that work with kids, but maybe like our rec department directors and that sort of stuff should be on board or anybody who's like really involved should go through the training. There's a sexual harassment assault training that you can do, I know, um, through at least there's one for baseball, but I think if you want to be a volunteer or going to be alone anywhere with children, you have to do it in order. I don't know actually about soccer. It's not like, through our rec department, though. Through the no. Rec, yeah, but through the but they, yeah, yeah the there's structure. something, yeah. yeah. It might be the same thing. It's yeah. probably got sport. It's the big yeah. organization that does it, so it's probably the same thing. We do the same thing with bowling. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All of our mm -hmm. coaches or volunteers have to have it, or they can't be with the kids. Yeah. But yeah, it might be something that we might want to look into. I don't know what cost would be, but um, or even if we just kind of have our rec director or some specific people that then work with the volunteer coaches to kind of mm -hmm. train the trainer class that they take, right. and then they can give it to the others. Yeah. yeah, but also just kind of spot like weird activity um, and behaviors from a child that also kind of could mm -hmm. be in a bad spot. Yeah. Um, right, yes, also it would kind of add another layer of eyes on the kids and families and stuff too. Um, but I, as a parent of kids that have gone into the rec stuff, have always kind of felt like we should be doing more about screening our volunteers. Because I think I don't have time to be a volunteer. Mm -hmm. You just say, hey, I want to do this, and then you're at practices along with kids. Yeah. Or in a vulnerable adult. Or elderly. Yeah. And yeah. 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 Wayne was on last night helping find a lady with Alzheimer's that had walked away. And at one point he said, I'm, I'm putting her in my vehicle and taking her to her home. Like, now you gotta. Yeah. Fortunately, it was Wayne, right? Like, oh, yeah, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just somebody you didn't screen and they got you. Quickly, mm -hmm. that could escalate into a yeah. pretty hairy situation for the town. Yeah. With the wrong cast of characters. But. Okay, so we're looking for that in May. That's our goal. Cool. cool. It'll be, be a fun three weeks. Yeah. <laughs> it's crazy right now. Yeah, at some point. Even when a snake swallows a gopher, it 
passes through and feels like the door is locked. Very good. Oh, as if on cue, next Perfect. up. Well, yes, yes, you are good. As an architect, they've been laying them out for you, so you're ready. <laughs> so, we have a um, dump truck replacement plan and a freighter that went down. They're kind of listed as two separate items, but if you're good talking about them as sort of one. Up here, fine. Set of pressures, say, because um, they all fit into the kind of the capital planning equipment matrix, and they do fit together a little bit. Um, I'll go grab the sheets. You gave me the truck sheets. You left them up on the table. Put them on the desk. You gonna go get them? You didn't want me to leave you here by yourself, did you? <laughs> <laughs> I thought I could make you smell a little bit. I sniffed it out. Was it a grader? Was it a, uh, all their dump trucks? All their dump trucks. Yeah. So John's going up to grab. We got a couple of different quotes. Um, in this case, there are two different sizes of, of truck. There's the bigger 10-wheeler type. Um, we generally use those on gravel roads. We're talking about snow removal to haul stuff. And there's sort of a smaller one um, that we might use in more of a village context, for example. And we augment some of those with like the 550 size um, trucks, which you find are really valuable, particularly in the village or when you've got narrow areas, tighter, tighter spaces, um, some of that. So one of them, the older, the oldest truck we have remaining that's in regular circulation is the one that has, much like the grader, got that spot where the repair costs exceed any useful value. Use, you know, we're not talking, we're talking about a truck that's sort of outside its useful life. Um, and the repair value is sort of, you want to put that much in to basically extend its life maybe a couple of years. Um, and then with lead times on trucks, we're still talking about even if we order today. Still out into the next fiscal year toward the end before that truck arrives and we start to make payments on it. I don't know where you put them. All right, I'll look you go for them. I swear I'm not rude now, I'm not messing with you, but there are nerd clusters there if you need to get to them. Um, so I was trying to describe the two trucks, but you can do that better than I can. You want to just run them through what broke and why and what we're thinking about with it? <coughs> First off, the truck that we want to replace is and 10 years old and over has got 100,000 miles on it. You know, it's been through 10 winters. Um, the exhaust, the DEF and the electronics went down this winter and it cost us over $20,000 to replace. <coughs> the body's rusted out and just, it's time. So our trucks right now are on a pretty good cycle, right? We've got them pretty well spaced out, so we're not hitting like a lot. These are, we got two right now that are hitting at about the same time, but that would be not normal. They're on my lunchbox, however, right? I didn't tell you they were. Six-wheeler in the village does the dirt on the south end of town and the center of town, and it takes two loads of dirt, you know, sand to sand the roads. I want to replace that truck with a ten-wheeler just because it'd be more efficient, you know. But also, we don't have a truck on the east side of town. Pretty much a truck, whoever gets done first, goes over there to take care of that route. So, if we could get a ten-wheeler, he would be able to help up there more. <coughs> <coughs> so. so when you look at the size of the fleet, we went through this probably just before you came on for the town. There was a conversation about getting to the right mix in the size of trucks 
remember this, the whole conversation about hope. We need some smaller trucks that can get around in the village streets easier, and the bigger trucks when you got to go from like the Rock <coughs> Center garage all the way out Clay White Road to the end. You need the capacity to handle that, and you needed the right mix of larger trucks for um, like when you're bringing in the sand in the summertime to stockpile for winter and whatnot. S switching that smaller truck. To a bigger truck, does that throw off the mix you need to meet all the needs? I mean, honestly, it would, it would we would benefit from it as well. Hauling material in the summer, hauling our sand pile, you know, our stockpile, um, ditching the current of floods that we've had, you know, just having a bigger truck. Um, it, it's nice to, in, that, in some aspects to have a smaller truck, but I think some of these trucks, especially in the village, are too big, you know some of the small side streets that we plow. Um, the 550 that we got, we replaced the 350 with. That works awesome. Um, I would suggest leaving a six wheeler with a wing to do all the main drags like Beanville, Park Street, Elm Street, you know, Central, Forest. And I would suggest, I think we could plow the majority of the town with that and two 550s. I think there'd be less property damage, you know, in intersections. I think they, everybody should equally share in their lawn being peeled back. That's my son that does that to me. <laughs> and it does happen. I mean, like, you, know, <laughs> you know, everybody knows that the edge of the road's there, but it's hard to see when you got to put a snow or two pieces on. I mean, yeah. They've been going around the last couple of days cleaning up, and I think they're doing, we're doing a really good job. But, um, so anyway. So you need approval to look at ordering these, but the, the larger truck won't be here for another 14 to 16 months. So yeah, right? so even if we ordered a truck today, we wouldn't receive it until April of next year. So that being said, you know, we've got one truck that's 10 years old now and the other one that's nine, you know. Do you wait the, you know, two years before you replace both of them trucks because even if we ordered them today like I said they won't even be built like the truck won't be out of the fact you know factory built until end of the year so so on the trucks what you're looking for approval tonight is one large truck and one small truck yeah, yeah. a six wheel and a ten wheel and we'll develop and we got to still develop the funding plan for that fully and some of that keys in with the next conversation as well because at the end of the day, the Highway Equipment Reserve doesn't have the funds currently to, to pull these off, um, to pull one of these off, let alone multiples. And so we've got to figure out the right combination of fund sources. Um, that could be everything. But some of it could be, like, with a lot of our trucks, we financed them and made an annual payment for and we have pricing three on, years, four years, yeah. five, whatever. And the, nice, to do. and the nice thing is that, you know, the other three ten wheelers that we have within the center are within a couple of years old, you know. So these next two trucks, we'll have a pretty good gap before we have to think about replacing them, you know. So, and build the reserve back up. Right, exactly. Yeah. So you're talking about 55000 a year for the for five year on the six wheeler. They quoted us at six years, but through Quirk State statute, five years is the max you can do before the voters have to authorize borrowing um, and then probably about 60,000 for the 10 wheeler so that would be covered if nothing else we could cover that with what the anticipated highway reserve balance would be next fiscal year if that's when we're going to start to pay for these trucks puts us a little back in terms of saving for whatever's next but it does cover those two truck payments and if we're out a couple of years with that and we're at a spot with after this nugget we'll have turned much like the crew itself we'll have turned over just about everything in there um, well, but it needed it. Uh, yeah, like and we were, we're the next conversation that we're going to have, which we might as well blend it all right in. Right. Um, our new grader <clears throat> is 15 years old. <laughs> like, okay, so our new grader has met its useful life, and our old grader at 31 years old just died. So the crane broke. It's so let's let's bring in the. I don't, before we make a, com a decision on the trucks, I'd like to get the whole picture on the table. Mm, yeah. Because it's 
there's actually two more pieces of equipment that we need to also consider, which is the grader and the excavator. And they have big, all these have big price tags. So these are two excavators. These are two. These are two excavators. But as everybody saw this winter, the grader was in use all year long. I think it's we plow, no I think we've honestly summer. plowed our roads with the graders, the dirt roads, as much as we did with the plow trucks, just because it was mud season, soft, you know, I mean, at least the graders, it's slower, but you can at least see the blade and see how much, you know, you're not pulling up a bunch of dirt and wrecking the roads any worse than they already were, so. Uh, but I can tell you, driving around, Randolph's roads are in much better shape than a lot of the other towns out there. Washington has some that are unpassable still. Right now, those are nice yeah, and solid. We've got more than 80 miles of dirt road to maintain. And so it's way more than one grader, one operator could feasibly pull off um, without a dramatic change in service and accessibility. Um, and we have been talking about the need for this, it's sort of shown up in the capital exercises as a year or two out because the reserve wasn't there and trucks were kind of a primary focus for a little bit along with some other equipment um, that we've done along the way. So this one finally gave the cost. So like we said, we use them not just for sort of summer maintenance activities, they're a key piece of winter maintenance, they're year round, they used to be heavily used part of the year and partially the others and now they go the whole time. We're training multiple operators on this. We've patched the short-term fix, you know, the short-term problem with a demo uh, of the John Deere unit. Um, face ID. No, I'm not going to be able to pass that. I didn't set it up. Yeah, high tech, man. High scale. I'm just going to write the number down so I don't want to forget to touch that again. I'll have it. <laughs> so for the greater, what we're talking about is a total of about a little less than 360. This new type of grader, it's John Deere. We priced out John Deere, Cat, um, went to the sort of the primary suppliers here in the region. Um, They're the only two that even had a grader. Yeah. John Deere had a grader on the ground. Caterpillar didn't have a grader on the, that wouldn't even be available till September, end of September, beginning of October. So. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you. See, Jeff. Yeah. You know, they, they allowed us to demo it to see how we like it. I mean, obviously. It doesn't like a new piece of equipment, but you know, it's, it's, it's the same model number, but it's got a little bit bigger blade, mold board, um, a little bit bigger horsepower. Of course, it's got the, you know, the def and everything, but I think it came through with, uh, so John Deere and Cat kind of got into a little bidding war. <laughs> Cat's like, well, we can get you this machine discounted, but you can't, you won't be able to get it till when it comes in. Okay. Well, the warranty was pretty good. So then John Deere asked, I mean, I'm going to tell them, you know. So they matched the price at three. It was like three fifty, three hundred fifty thousand. But then they throw in a, I think it's a six year warranty with five thousand hours. I mean, our old graders got it's fifteen years old, and it just turned four thousand hours. You know, so that's pretty good. That's a good warranty on a piece of machinery that's got so many electronics. I mean, yeah. you know how many electronics John and Wayne, mm -hmm. you know. So, but what was it? You were telling me the metric that. 100 hours equals, or whatever it was. I forget what it was. A thousand hours, or what but it's 5,000 hours. A, a thousand time. hours is equal to 200,000 miles on the car. Yeah. So to put it in some context, in terms so. of how far you're going. So like we said, there isn't funding available for that either. Same conditions where a lease to own would be a five year payment. That's a pretty big nugget. Anything longer than that needs voter approval. Um, useful life of a grader. We've stretched them out, but 15 is probably where they should be. Um, we're going to turn them over. But we can stretch the other one out longer and try to plan for a different cycle there. Um, I also get caught in this spot all the time where they ride the grader till it dies and then. It's a lot more expensive than the last one you bought 30 years ago. 15 years ago is when we bought the last one. Right. Yeah. I bet the most of us remember that. So then we have um, the excavator, mm -hmm. which we continue to rent one each time we need it. 
and as we keep getting mud seasons and rain events that are causing damage, it's all the time. Right? We have a backhoe that we share a little bit with water wastewater, but the size, efficiency just isn't there. And that is at the end of its useful life as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is there anything up there that still works? <laughs> We're getting there. <laughs> <laughs> we don't, get, don't get me wrong. The old grader, if that thing stuck around and they stayed, you know, that was a, it's a good piece of machinery. Just, it's, you know, I had them do a, give me a quote on it. It's like 30 something thousand dollars to put a new crank in and rebuild the motor. Yeah. Then at that point, you get a 31 year old piece of machinery, right? I mean, with a new crank. But with a new crank. all kinds of other problems. Right, but at that point, if the hydraulic pump goes, you know, that's another fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000. So it's just, you know, yeah, it's a good piece of machinery, but it's 31 years old and it's got 21,000 hours on it. So. Didn't we put into the budget something about an excavator or something? So we talked about it, but an excavator in the past. Yeah, we've had and, this conversation. And we've right looked, now. but as much, a, a tracked excavator is really nice, but, you know, like Trevor said, we have 80 something miles of dirt road. We have 55 miles of pavement that we maintain. A rubber tired excavator, you can drive literally from the shop to any part of the road, any part of town. You can ditch paved roads as well as the dirt roads. We can change culverts in any way, shape, or form. You know, that everyday use. The machine could literally be used eight to ten hours a day. You know that would occupy three, you know, employees on a permanent basis. You know, in the event of a flood or you know a windstorm, like with all these down trees we just had, I mean it'd be really nice instead of trying to cut a tree that's ten feet in the air to go up with an excavator, drive up to it, grab it, and literally take it out of everyone's arms away. You know, so. Um, but the other positive is these grants that we're getting. Yeah. Um, and whatnot, we can charge our own staff time and equipment to the grants. So every hour that we use an excavator, a truck, or an employee, there's a rate set for that item, and it all can be charged to the grant to help pay for it. So when we look at the hours that we use excavators, we even talking to FEMA today, he was like, and this excavator, and this excavator, and all of those, our excavator can be working on those projects and that's another way to get some of that money back into the town that pays for it as long as we keep having FEMA um, qualified disasters and I bet you believe that we will <laughs> <laughs> but, but it also like the grants and aid grant that comes up later that's one we've rented an excavator for in the past year so it's not enough to offset the cost of obviously but there's some, well, it just sounds like some we just could really, this would yeah. be a really useful piece of equipment for us. Yeah, and some of what we're seeing with our equipment profile, both in terms of the use and with something like this, is that, yeah, we use them for what has always been considered road maintenance, but there's a lot of, like, climate response, stormwater response that we end up doing, whether it's from dealing with mud to the ditching to the culverts, you know, sizing those to the armoring of everything, it seems. Yeah. Yeah. And those weather events are not becoming less frequent, and they're yeah. not expected to. It's the game we're right. in. Yeah. So we need it. So the price on that, just to give you a lower one. So they're both. So we once again, John. Them first, and then we can say we found one cheaper. <laughs> so John Deere. I, I quoted one out with John Deere. Of course, they don't make different size machines. They make pretty much one machine, and it's just too big. That one is three hundred fifty thousand. Um, Devlin which was, used to be Doosan, it's kind of like an odd, oddball name or whatever. Um, they haven't been in business a long, long time, but um, they were 225000 380 and then I went up to Volvo, um, Sierra Woods up in Williston. They finally got back to me. Um, Volvo's been in business a long time. Perfect size machine. We went up, demoed it in their yard, you know. They went right through it with us. Um, that's the same amount, it's 225900 so. And that comes with an 84 month warranty of 4,000 hours. So, I mean, these places are really big on warranty. Obviously, they know the amount of electronics and, you know, all the sensors and everything with the motor, they kind of have to be. So, um, but. In five to seven years ago, when the electronics start to fail, 
happened in prior stops in terms of the equipment it's happening to us. That seems for whatever reason that's the magic frame. So what do you what do you need from, from us tonight? Well, some guidance on where to go with how to pay for all of it. Um, so we just laid out a substantial amount of money there. With the trucks, there is a way to lease finance those for a five year lease on. It's less than ideal from the standpoint that we've tried to buy down the amount of debt that we have. But at the same time, there's a way to get both trucks done, queue us up for the next truck in line, and keep that kind of equipment reserve capacity a little bit preserved. Obviously, we'd have to use what's in there to make those debt service payments in all likelihood in fiscal 25 or whatever the first year they're due. Um, with the excavator and the grader, it's about consideration of the options. There are those lease to own options. We don't have those priced out yet, um, but we can certainly do that. With that, obviously, you incur some interest related costs tied to the borrowing, so um, that gets factored in there as well. Um, there's a blended approach where we use whatever funds we have and finance some of it. I don't love that, it makes it a little bit messier. Um, uh, there are ARPA funds um, available for this type of stuff. Otherwise, there would be putting these decisions off to another time and say seeking voter approval for some sort of longer term. But then we're not due to be before them again for a little while. And then that impacts availability of equipment. I don't think they'll let us keep the demo forever, for example. Um, though that would be nice. Just they just forgot key. that we I had just it. Lost the key, guys. <laughs> so, so some of it is found every day during work hours. This is coming down the hall. Each store. So we, we can do the calculations on all of it, but I, I think we were looking for a sense of which direction to, to head in. Um, I wish these things aren't weren't all coming due, uh, and then when we do sort of the latest and greatest FEMA update after, it'll this will feel even tickier. Um, but how, how these are all pretty necessary. And, how does how does the cost here fit in fit in in terms of our um, long term borrowing? Given that we've got some some notes that are going to be paid off over the next couple of years now, right? We're getting yeah, fiscal twenty seven and twenty eight. There's a few that come so off. I'm just wondering if we've got some capacity there that we can kind of what we can do now to get to that point. And then have. Um, yeah. I, want, I just. I mean, right. I don't want to really. I never want to borrow more money for these kinds of things. It's really not the way we want to do it. But right. it just seems like this is one of those situations where, if you don't do it, it's going to cost you more to not do it than than, than to do it, right? Over. I, don't, I think we've got to find a way to do it. Yeah. Um, right. And I think we have to tap into the ARPA money on this. Because the grader we need now, right, we've got one 15 year old grader. I just and we need two to run. Yeah, we'd never be able to maintain down with one grader. I mean, it would be good, but I'm not going to lie if I say our oh, roads would suck. Yeah, no, road infrastructure is critical. And I don't want that because be I think for dentists. I think we've made yeah. a huge improvements in the last few years. And yeah, well, we got to we keep forward. building on where we are for sure, and, and that's one of the core functions of our municipal government is making is having good, you know, right. good roads. So, in your opinion, is the greater the biggest priority out of the three or four pieces of equipment we're talking about? Yeah, I'm going for sure. I mean, yeah. The, the trucks, if we order them now, we've got a year to figure mm -hmm. that out. So we won't have to pay for the trucks till probably, I mean, we have received the first truck in probably May, April, May. Uh, that's when, we, yeah, that's when the first year. payment would be, and then the second one would be June or July. So we so might oh, figure out another talking way about to next year. Oh, next yeah. year, yeah. Not, not this year, yeah. that's next year. I guess it'll so. see a year to figure out how to Right. But we gotta. Um, I mean, we have to. We have to at least sign for them and say that yes, we do want them, so they can move forward. And, and it sounds like we have some money in our equipment reserve that could go towards at least getting us started on those trucks, and we have yeah. another year to put some more money in those reserves. So it's that's next year is 2025, and then we have a couple of years of 
using our reserve to just pay for it. Debt, right? Payments on these things for another couple of years, and then you could choose next year to put your budget surplus into your equipment reserve to, to pay for those. Yeah. Voters did authorize that. Was you might be thinking about that as opposed to some in the budget. There was a change on the warning that the surplus the percentage of it would go into the equipment reserve if we have one. If we have one at the end of. But in March we can. We can see. What's we going can on. put it in right, like. We vote in March. We can make that adjustment so that the reserves all go into the equipment reserve. Yeah. So whatever your budget surplus is can go in, and that would help pay for those trucks, so we didn't have to finance it. Mm -hmm. I think the two we got to figure out. I mean, I think we've got to authorize the the, per, the ordering of the trucks yeah. and sort it out. I think tonight, what we kind of got to figure out is. What do we do with this grader in the escalator? So we're looking at almost six hundred thousand dollars for those two. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Um, is the excavator available, or do you have to order it? What's that? The excavator is available now, or do you have a a time before it comes in? It's a bit. I mean, it would it would be probably two weeks before we get it. They have to. They have to oh, sue that. You it's know. available now. It, it, <laughs> it's quick. It's available now. Yeah. <laughs> they, they have two of them. No year to play with that one. No. And so, I mean, they gave us almost a sixty thousand dollar discount. I know it's, but that was when I saw that. It was pretty. Big deal. Yeah. So two twenty-five nine. We approve this to the select board members get turns playing at the machine. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Come on up, we'll train you. Do <laughs> you stay on staff that. for the length of the equipment? <laughs> What's that? What was that? Are you going to stay on staff for the length of the equipment? <laughs> <laughs> you, are you going to stay on? <laughs> sure. Sure. <laughs> Whatever you want to cluster. Well, that's that's got some value. Too. That's got some significant value, absolutely. What's that? gonna be out there like trying to break the machine. Chaining oh, <laughs> you to this machine for the next thirty years. Fifteen, right? Fifteen. Oh, that's right. Fifteen. 15. 15. <laughs> I haven't gone anywhere yet. I'm probably not going. <laughs> You keep threatening me though, Larry. This sounds know. like this is sounding like a better and better deal all the time. <laughs> <laughs> keep going, see what I'm thinking. Yeah, yeah. um, so we could authorize the purchase of the excavator tonight, and then and the grader. And the grader. Yeah, okay, that's what I mean. The excavator seems least urgent if we can rent something. I know it makes sense to buy it, but it's a lot of money. Well, how much is it costing us to rent it? Um. Eight to nine thousand dollars a month. How much? I'm sorry. Eight to nine thousand dollars a month. Eight to nine thousand a month. And where does that money come from? There's a budget line for equipment rental. It's an so, operating cost, so it comes yeah. out of his office. So we have. Can we rent it from ourselves to move that money over? Like, if we buy one, can we use? It'd be more that you'd essentially zero out that line. And <laughs> 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 Just do the cart real <laughs> So but if, it, if it's in that budget, yeah, so instead of, instead of using that money right. to, in our line item there, we'd be able to move over to buy the, the debt service, basically. If we already have bu money budget for paying for that. Yeah. Well, it's to pay for yeah. everything that we rent. So we have a line item yeah. to rent equipment. Yeah, right. And we've been, renting, we've been renting the excavator because the grants that we get allow it. And so they'll pay, they pay the rent on the equipment, and we just I might see. use so that's it not to do a little bit of budget. our stuff. And that's coming out of the grant. Okay, so the grant money would then go towards paying off our excavator to be ours instead of paying. We would have it, and that would be money that would come into us. It's the same as our trucks. Our trucks are paid for, right? We do work on a grant. Our employees are paid for. They do work on a grant. Then we can bill against the grant for that. But we, labor but we, but and we can't really equipment. budget from those kinds of grants because we don't really know every right. year what's going to come in from those. The only one we know is the grants annual grant city. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, but it's reimbursable through FEMA too. 
right? All our equipment and our Right, but in terms of Stuff like, because I understand yeah. what you're saying, it makes a lot of sense. You know, if we know we have expenses for rental, then why don't we just use that money instead to be servicing debt, like, and paying off the machine, like. But I this think, one, but there might does, but be another path. I just thought of both the stormwater and gravel road reserves have a sufficient balance that if we split it. Between the two, you could cover the excavator with existing reserves and not disrupt any planned projects. You couldn't do it for everything. It's pretty. Would allow you this and then keep that capacity to use it both to match the grants and aid grant if other stuff comes up. You want to do another project, especially in the way of equipment. Um, so, could we do that for the excavator and then? So you could do that for the excavator. Consider Arva for the for lease the, the trucks. Yeah, lease to own the trucks, and then you've got the greater. <coughs> I made a motion to approve the staff's effort to <laughs> <laughs> create a replacement plan for the trucks, the greater, and the excavator. <laughs> so we're just we're just authorizing you to come up with a plan tonight. So. Ken, if you want to authorize me to buy can. stuff. Was that, well, we had a motion. Was, a, was the motion to approve his plan? This is, well, I was just reading when it was here, approve staff's effort to create a replacement plan, but yeah. Yeah. I can, I, what do I have to say? I can adjust that. Um, I have, uh, we have a plan, wait, what's the plan on you? That's the thing. She's we're reading off the notes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The one he just came up with. Exactly. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so we're saying yes. <laughs> <laughs> so the notes are fairly <laughs> muted, just to, in that we're seeking direction, but um, I wanted to have the conversation. So that's where that motion is based on. But what we've sort of laid out is a little more detail. Um, where we know we can cover two of the three items through those mechanisms. So is the motion you're looking for tonight to purchase the greater using ARPA funds, purchase the excavator using the two reserve, reserve funds, and to order the trucks mm -hmm. with the intent that we will come up with a way to increase the equipment reserve to yeah. so we'd sort of pay step or finance it when they yeah. open have to pay for them. Stepped it out, so yeah, the trucks, that seems to be, there's some agreement there, the excavator, there's agreement there, and then whatever, however you want to do that, too complicated to put that all together in one motion. No, I think no. it's right there. Okay. And he took notes, so I'd just be like, so moved. <laughs> <laughs> you pulled a Stephanie! <laughs> Congratulations. So before we vote, I just want to just double check that we really don't see any other options for the grader besides our funds. Yeah, yeah, it's sort of your, your available funds, our available funds. as you have uh, because those reserve splits don't work the amounts aren't mm -hmm. for that BP and in a way that they can maintain capacity to do other stuff yeah, um, yeah. that'll still leave each one with a couple of hundred thousand dollars which could be a single project in the gravel road reserve right, right. or even so, a small model. so we're really in a position that if we didn't have this ARPA money we would just be like no greater this year suck it up mm -hmm. That, I mean, that's, that, that's, that's yeah. what I'm hearing. I mean, if Scott can cover his ears, we can go and knock off some banks and bank stores. <laughs> There's a crime spree. That, that's another option. Yeah, I was going to say, what, a, what other towns got our yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, we, we go steal one from somebody else. Just break it over their town. Okay. But no, I, I think those are the primary ones. So we can look at that. We could see what a lease down looks like, but it's not going to be cheap. And then you actually have put it up. We'll have added that problem to the highway equipment reserve. So we can solve the truck. It's one of the things we can solve the truck problem through what we know is coming in, and or with the time we we couldn't solve the truck problem in a seventy-five to ninety thousand dollar greater payment on top, or whatever that works out to be for five. At least for five years is seventy-eight thousand dollars. So yeah, we're about seventy-nine. 79. So we can figure out two, but not three. Can we hold off on the excavator 
and use that plan to buy the grater, or at least pay down some of that grater, and then add a little bit of ARPA funds to you it. can't get the grater in that fund. Uh, yes, because of the classification. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. The rational nexus is in the strong. So, and we can't do one dump truck and a grader. But we don't have to worry and about paying the dump truck to that store. Right, but. Um, You're going to make payments on the trucks, probably. Mm -hmm. Or do something where we take, you know, carry forward and put it into the equipment reserve to pay it down. So we haven't figured out our FEMA costs, though, that we were talking about using ARPA funds for. Yeah, and they were a chunk of it. Oh. They're going to be a bigger chunk of that. So then if we buy this grader and then we pay FEMA, we've pretty much used almost all the ARPA funds at that point. So we're going to be down to like a couple hundred thousand dollars, maybe. Could be. Really could be, yeah. The positive is we're sticking with the intent of the ARPA funds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know the other positive I just thought of is our staff loves the fact that they're in equipment that doesn't break down and leave them <laughs> stranded throughout town. Right. And unfortunately, we did not have a good replacement plan for or anybody that was on top of it. But I was there the other day, yesterday when MTE delivered the new sidewalk machine and the attachments to use for other things. and. Reg was right in there just grinning from ear to ear because he doesn't have to work on that sidewalk machine anymore. So that's employee retention also. But um, it sucks to have all these hit at the same time. I, just don't, I don't see where we have a choice. It's more of a, a ch I think our choice is on how do we pay for it. And right. It really does feel like, yeah. Or, or, or dramatically alter the service and the reliability of said service. Yeah. Yeah. We get as far as we get until that 15-year-old grader gives up the ghost. Well, the 15-year-old grader's going to be on the side of the road this summer if it's got to keep up with every road by itself. Or down over the bank. Are you talking about the peanut? What? What? Okay. Well, so, well it, the idea is some of the FEMA money that we have to pay would come out of our phone. Oh, we and have so, a match on FEMA. Right. And so, so if we do that and the greater, it pretty much takes out any ARPA funds for the most part. It's, um, it's, there's some data going to them from today's meeting, and then they'll be able to start paying back, reimbursing us on some of that, and we'll have a better idea of what our match is. Like we went over like a new riffraff plus section that wasn't done like that before. It's 100% funding, not 90% like we had estimated. So that's why he said it's we're not sure exactly what it's going to take. Right. Because some of them, and then some of it, they said it was only 15% reimbursed. So but we haven't hit, and the only place we might hit that is on the North Randolph Road. 15% um, match on the North Randolph Road? Not on the whole oh. thing. It's on little pieces of it. But that would not what we don't know is what that looks like. Right. That's where it doesn't feel good to use the art for money without knowing that number. And so the other option is to buy the grader but lease it. It would be the other the only other option. So we have ARPA funds for it or we there's not, not eighty thousand sitting there to make that payment though. Right. Without putting a huge damper on the operations budget of the highway department. If you lease to own and start it with ARPA funds, you bake in whatever that payment would be as an increase in the first year you're not using them. So it's just that's a future impact. Is it's doable, it'll work, but it, that adds in What would happen if sorry? What would happen if FEMA came back larger than we expect, and it goes? So we spend this. We've already spent some ARPA funds. We spend this for the greater, and then we only have this much left, and FEMA's more than ARPA. What would that? You see we, what I'm saying? We might be asking voters to approve something to borrow to cover that. Anyway, so some of the towns with more 
you know, greater levels of damage in terms of the costs of that to sort of consider what they're doing so you know, beyond be short term. Be because of what's going on on Stock Farm Road, for example, and North Randolph Road, we, even if we saved the rest of it, I don't think it may not be enough to say go all the way to the nightmare scenario. And it's, you're going to borrow one side or the other. Right? And so, you know, it's really gamble it now by the greater using our for money if we've got to have more to make the match deal with that when it comes in because um, it may not we may have enough by the time they get done we're going to be looking at some other mitigation stuff and I don't know we were trying to build a case that all of the damage on the stock farm road belonged in the July event because that's 90% funding versus December event, which is 75% funding. So there's a lot of variables there that they, yeah. I mean, they were buying what we were putting down. They just had to go back and get the leadership to buy it. But it's, that's an unknown at this point, but it's always going to be an unknown. They're the same numbers, right? we got to make the same numbers work, whatever they are. Using the ARPA money now, we don't have the interest so we get to what the FEMA number is. When we get to the FEMA number, we'll have to take a step back and figure that one out. What is our plan forward to making sure that we're not in this predicament again? Just because this is almost like a million dollars on the table tonight of just equipment being shot all at once. Is there a plan in place to kind of make four rotations? No, I, 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 I know. Oh, no, 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 no. It's not, no, no, no. It's not, that's not like an accusation towards anybody, but like, but like you know, like in, in, in what happens in seven years, so you can't know like, like, where everything is broken again. But that's where we're getting the replacement cycle. So we, we are trying to put a plan, yeah. I mean, I know it's hard to beat those up, and I, it, I know there's been years of like lack of that saving money for equipment and taking care of it. So I, I understand it's just a perfect storm. It's absolutely no accusation, but we don't want to have this happen again in 10 years to another select board of surprise. Well, we're really sitting here, and both graders should be replaced. Right. right. Our new grader is 15 years old, yeah. which is the useful life. Right. And so how are we preparing yes. for that one to that die one like is, two years? Uh, after July, it's going to probably get a, it's going to get a makeover. It's about, it's going to cost 18 to 20,000 dollars, I think. Just, just under 19,000, John Deere's going to come in, they're going to put a new turbo on it, um, give the valves, a, a flash the valves, uh, new injectors, um, front main seal starting to leak, they're going to replace that. A couple main bushings on the main part of the grade. Sure. I've had them come in. Yeah. I'm just that is on the old grader. That is just too. Right. You know. And that's great, but in five years, it it's probably gonna be completely done, right? Well, and so what you know, like, I just think we need to figure, or maybe it's already happening because I haven't been on the board very long, but making sure that we have really healthy reserves so we can keep up with these things. So we're not just like there is no money, but we yeah. we have. I understand all this stuff is a have to. But capital, we capital can't. Capital planning would be the key. Right. To have like an actual workable one. Yeah. We've had some that maybe cover a year or two, and then you get up to year five, and it's this is what we hope. Or something happens. Right. Like, you know, like we have a crazy storm, and our equipment takes a lot of abuse, and then we are kind of shortening that cycle of what typical use is. Right? I mean, that's. So I feel like we need to have better reserves in place so we can. We won't get 30 some odd years out of a grader again because we're using them year round now. Exactly. That's, this is kind of the point I'm so trying yeah. to say. Is like Your useful life has got to be adjusted on those right. to figure it exactly. out. So now step outside of that and start looking at all the other yep. pieces like, you know, fire trucks and mm -hmm. cop cars. In the, yep. You know, the police have some, water sewer has some. Tommy and for vehicles. <laughs> he doesn't but drive it anyway. I'll I know. So have been in months. We can try to do without that. I think yeah. we should probably move this along. Yep. Fine. Okay, so we have a motion in the second on the table. So, so the motion specifically is use ARPA funds to buy the grader, order the two trucks, which will be the least, mm -hmm. and use the reserves to buy the excavator. 
Because some really yeah, swirl the here. The trucks, we haven't decided they got to be leased yet, though. Right. We're going to look at whether we, this year's reserve money and transferring next year's carry forward into the reserves would do it. But we will but we're not, finance we're not it. Making, Worst case, we'll have to finance it. Right. But we're not okay. making, we're not, okay. So we're, we're just going to, we're ordering the trucks. We're not deciding anything else other than that. Because if there's a way we can maneuver everything to right. be able to yes. no, you're, not of finance, we'll do yep. it. Everybody clear on what is on the table? Mm -hmm. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? No. Sorry, guys. Motion carries. Who was the second? How about Alyssa was she was the motion. first and I'll second. I'll second. All right. Next item is the UTV agreement and trailer purchase proposal. I won't wonder why, but take a thumbs. I'll the moment of that decision. Good luck to clean your kitchens. I'm going to go home with that. Good night, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Oof. That, was, uh, that was not very kind. What's up? You said you're going to go to bed. Well, by the time I get home, you guys should probably be gone. Oh, uh, yeah. 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 Have a good night. Thank you. You haven't seen their list. What's that? You haven't seen their list. <laughs> See you, John. Thank you, John. Good night. Just want to make sure we touch base. This is another one of those things that I want to get done and then uh, air splash for a little bit. I am working on an agreement that has some of the guidelines that came out of the last conversation. I mean, it said there might be a proposal related to a trailer as well. And if there is, that would be good to get it now so it's incorporated in any agreement. There's some equipment, too, that we need to maybe put some in there. On it, so. so it's all in there in your... I mean, the challenge right now is, with it being in your ownership, something happens, that's where the liability goes. But I don't... I think it goes to us too, right? On that equipment, especially, but you know, the UTV and the trailer at the scene. So, we have a trailer that we're looking at that the department, the membership would like to purchase, um, but we're trying to do things differently and come to you before um, purchasing it. We have a, a price from um, Lucky Dimmick's. Um, truck sales has the ability to get a trailer for us out of state and they'll handle all the back end of it and bring the trailer to them and then we'll pick it up from them at a very good price. It is big enough to handle the, the uh, side by side, uh, big enough to handle the extra equipment that we would be putting in there to do rescues um, and we would be able to um, there are some designs for um, if we wanted to use it as a emergency operations center, um, like if we had a, a situation where we needed to set up a command post, we could take it and do that. Um, where we can have maps and we can have this incident that you heard about last night could have been an all night situation where the, we had this Alzheimer's patient that had walked away from her home up in the country and they had no idea where she was. It, it turned out really well that um, I came across her heading to the house, um, but it certainly could have been a heck of a lot worse where we could have brought that trailer in, set it up and used it as a command post. The state police were on their way. So what we would like to do is to get the permission to to secure the trailer before it gets sold out from underneath us. But we're coming to you guys first before we did that. Have you looked at any of how other departments handle moving those trailers? We have, um, and um, pickups are probably the best scenario. Um, right now, we have the ability to do that um, with private pickups and or if we needed to secure um, 
we've talked with John before that if we needed to get a town pickup in to move it, we could do that. Um, personally, I don't think hooking it behind a fire truck is the right answer. I don't either. So we've kind of ex nade that. That's not going to happen. Um, we can't put it behind. If it's town, if town has ownership, we can't put it behind a private pickup for insurance purposes. But so I would, that's where I was kind of like, eh, now what are we? What are we down to? So. The mo you would get toned out to some event that you well, felt the trailer needed to go and then what reach out to John and and coordinate it that way and see if we I mean like Brookfield the other day had a situation last week where they were needing an ATV and we yeah. couldn't go so well, they ended up having to get a private ATV to go up and help bring this lady out of her home because they couldn't get the ambulance to her um, yeah, let's not use that as example. The details don't quite match on that one. So, but um, I think I think moving it there, moving it to a site where it's needed is is an issue. And then we would just need to look at what does that look like. Like, is the is the highway department going to be on call to be called out to move that? Is like what that. We would just need to have some like communication plan or something. What is that? What's the protocol for you yeah. when you need it? How you get it? You know, Mike is willing to work with you and help do the background work on writing up a potential proposal to get to you for yours and, and the attorney's look over. I mean, I understand that you and your office are busy, but we're coming up now. We're it's... gonna do this again. Can we just focus on getting forward from here? Oh, that's what I'm trying to focus on, is like to giving you a hand person. if you need it. I appreciate that. So what we need, so um, when we had the conversation <clears throat> about accepting the UTV, <clears throat> excuse me, Mike had said he was gonna look into the trainings that other departments did or what's available other than the state ATV safety class. We'd identified the ATV safety class and he was said he knew of a couple other departments that had these and was going to talk to them about the trainings that they give to their members and how they make sure like so they're only like those that are trained and know what they're doing. Correct. Because you're talking about putting a water tank on it. Correct. Right, which is going to change your center of gravity. Correct. And how you respond, like on it's, hills. It's or manufactured that way. Yeah. With it. The wrong person in it. Right. Absolutely. I don't disagree be, with you. There needs to be proper training. Yeah. And did so? Did he have any luck finding somebody that had one and what they? I'll have to get in use. touch with him. Okay. I thought that was somebody was through. just in the news. Uh, St. Albans, was it? Mm -hmm. Up that area with the training they did that was around theirs. Um, boy, I'm drawing a blank, but you guys probably know who else has them. Doesn't yeah. Bethel have one? They do. Um, they have a chief for that? Not that I'm aware of. <laughs> they don't have an. Uh, they reached out to the manager. They didn't have anything. They don't have any That's training. Yeah. Eggs. Um, and they pull theirs with their private vehicles. I got to follow up with the St. Albans Chiefs too, because we did make contact after that news article. Their mm -hmm. manager asked if we could share something. I'm just going to make sure we follow up with that. So I would say if if the, if Mike can find samples of these type of agreements or whatnot, that that would be helpful to have as a resource document. And the document should include the UTV, the equipment, because we talked about its um, extraction tools, 
Is that right, Lane? That that was purchased by the department you're talking. Yeah. Yeah, it's too. Well, by um, the nonprofit. Correct. Right. It's two um, pieces of extrication equipment that was purchased. So if you, I mean, I guess if you want them on the trucks and want to be able to use them, they probably got to come over in this agreement too, so they're insured mm -hmm. and covered. Um, So the trailer part, you're wanting to buy it, and we're wanting to make sure it's clear how, where it's going to be, what it's going to be used for, and how it's going to be moved. Well, it would only be right. used for fire department right. um, call-outs. Yeah. Is that what you mean? Like the type. Like, it'll be there, it'll be used to move the UTV, it'll be used potentially as a command post, so if you had some other I mean, thing and needed to move it for that, yeah, I would assume it's going to be stored inside the station. At the station with the UTV in it, probably, so it's ready Correct. to go. Like, just that kind of un understanding. Ought to be in there somewhere, I would think. What am I missing? But if it's going to be moved by a town truck, I mean, how often are we talking about its use? That um, three years. Seem, three years. Yeah. I don't know. It depends. <clears throat> you might get two or three calls in a row and then not get another one for six months that needs it. Right. You know, it's, uh, it's hard to predict. But, I mean, I think the calls that they were talking about are like somebody gets injured on the bike path or um, a, a forest fire type thing where you want to get tools and water back. Um, it could, I guess, you know, depending on, because um, you guys get called in sometimes for lift assist or, I don't know, uh, it might have been Brookfield that had to go out across that field and the guy had fallen off his horse and... Right. I just, he was, here. I think I worry about the strain on the town resources for something that's not the town's, right? So if it's a town truck that has to move it and it ends up being needed more often than just a few times, is that? I think if it got to that point, I don't see it being out a lot. I don't see it's a big strain. But I mean, we'll have to look at that. Like, obviously, if you get to the point where you're taking it out every week, that's a, a different scenario that you'd need to look at. Kind of what is, what does that look like? And doesn't East Randolph have a smaller truck? Isn't that they have a? Isn't it a brush truck? Brush fire response truck or something? It was one of the old ones that they changed. That's more like a. What's there is white. It's more like a pickup, kind of with a. It's a little bit bigger than a pickup, but not by much. I mean, that's almost your right size to be pulling this trailer. I guess I would say if it became a burden, then we'd have to look at what happens at that point. Right? What's that resource and. And what does that look like? But right now, I would, I would guess you're, if you had five to six call, I would say five calls is stretching it even in a year, where you'd need that. I'm thinking maybe three, three, four calls. But you probably are gonna have a training, right? Where you wouldn't, because you can't train in that at the station. So you're gonna need them to move it to train. So. No, but like the training that we would do, you can go down to the playground with it. But you can't, because you can't run it on the road. True. <laughs> so so maybe six, <laughs> six to eight times a year. I don't think yeah. it's a terrible lift for them. 
Is there any way we can put language in there, though, that seems excessive, but there might have to be a different plan put in place or something? Like well, if something yeah. happened and they were using it all the time, that we might review it. Is there any reason to do I that? I think that's or? an operational thing that okay. Trevor can review. Okay. Cool. Anyway, on kind of how we do it, like if it gets to be out of control, but I don't, know that I feel like six to eight times a year is out of control. Okay. Obviously the trainings would be scheduled ahead of time so they would be able to work that in but the responses aren't going to be. Mm -hmm. I don't know John can get called out today for probably some of the same events they're going to get called out for. Quite often. Is there any action needed from us, or is that just going no, to No, I think plan? what Wayne was looking for tonight was kind of what is the process, where are we at, and what about the trailer? and then kind of what are we, Can we secure are the trailer? we going to, right, um, so the nonprofit has the money, and you're buying the trailer. So right. is the trailer being bought in the town or Randolph's name? Or are you buying it as a nonprofit and they're gonna to have to transfer title? Whichever way you want. It feels like it ought to go right as one. What does that do for us on a on a policy perspective from procurement and whatnot? Is the town allowed to just go out and buy a trailer? policy envisions that there's some sort of bidding competitive right. process, even some. if it's just soliciting quotes, doesn't have to be a full formal thing. Did you get more than one quote, or you just went down and chatted with Lucky? We've had a couple of quotes. Not everybody can get the trailer that's wide enough to handle the machine. We've gotten two quotes, and we went with Lucky so far, um, as far as an internal department decision. What's the cost? Is it, I mean, you can do like a simplified bid and just get one more quote just to cover your bases. Is Lucky's the low bidder? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's yeah. giving us a discount. So it may be just reaching out to one more vendor to have them price the same type of thing, even if they, but even did you say not somebody came taxpayer back? money? Well, it's, if it's gonna be titled in the town of Randolph, we have to, but did you say somebody didn't bid because they didn't make one? For yes. somebody, okay, we've, so then you got your three, right? Because one said no, no, no bid counts, a higher one, and then lucky, so you have okay. them. So the idea would be that we would buy it? Well, I don't know, I was just wondering if it needs to be titled. It's gonna be titled when you buy it. Does it make sense to title it to the nonprofit? and then show them transferring it to the town or just title it in the town's name right to begin with. Didn't that's kind of where I was going. Wasn't the uh, ATV titled to the town? No, hasn't been transferred over yet either, last I knew. I have to check the title book. Did you register it, the UTV? I don't believe, I, I think it's all being waited on mm, to so be able to do it then. to the town specs. You wouldn't have a title if you haven't registered it yet. You'd have the uh, certificate of origin. And that would be it. So you probably got a sales document that says whatever the nonprofit. <coughs> Bless you. Thank you. What's the so, pros and cons to them buying it as the town of Randolph versus buying it as the nonprofit? And well, the money has to come from the nonprofit to the town, and the purchase gets made by the town. Now the town's going to make sure whoever it is is the vendor. If it ends up being lucky, that's less of a problem because they're already in the system, so there isn't anything extra needed. If it were a new vendor, it's tax forms and stuff like that. If they write the check to Lucky's and he delivers it on the, to wherever, is that, does the town have to write the check if it's titled in the town? Yeah. Does it have to run through our books or can it just yeah. be? I don't 
don't know the accept, answer to yeah, that. They don't normally accept the open bid for It's either stuff we buy or. Um, so for me, I think it's the two simplest, most traditional ways is the association buys it and at some point it transfers ownership to the town out of the payment loop. Or the association pays, puts the money in to the town funds and then the town buys it and it's in town ownership at that point. Um, you're a nonprofit, right? Mm -hmm. and so you're tax exempt mm -hmm. for. Um, are you tax exempt on trailers and stuff too? Do you know? I don't know. I mean, it it doesn't seem right to have you. I mean, if you can buy it as a nonprofit and they do the DMV paperwork, which lucky, I mean. It seems like the easiest thing to do is figure out how you get it to transfer and buy it in the town's name to begin with, because otherwise you're going to go through all the DMV processes of the nonprofit and then have to go through it again as the town right behind it, right? And so even if you don't have to pay the tax, you still got to pay the title and registration fee. And is there any way it could be like dual ownership and then they pay like dual title? No. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. I um, I think we'll just have to work out what ha what that process looks like, maybe, and think it through. Because both organizations would have to go through the DMV. Maybe so it not. sounds it, like the, the simplest way would be for us to give a check to the town of Randolph to purchase the piece of equipment. I think it probably is, Wayne. Um, Unless Lucky can sell it to you without running it through DMV, and he might be able to do that too. He might be able to do it without leaving it leaving the lot, right? That's where the problem is. No, that's it. when you take ownership. But sure. I've bought ATVs before. We didn't allow it to go through the DMV process because we took them to New Hampshire and left them there, so they weren't being used in Vermont. But I think it's. Uh, I think you can buy, you just, and not run through the whole DMV process, because you can buy a car out of city and come to Vermont and then have to go to DMV and do it. So I think there's two options there. So if Lucky can, if I can recap so I make sure I have it right, if Lucky can sell it to us without it going through DMV and letting the town do it through DMV, that's one option. Yeah. And if they can't, then making the donation to the town and the town would purchase it from Lucky's. Yeah, but tell Lucky he's got to do all the paperwork for DMV so the town just has to sign. <laughs> 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 yeah, that is right. mm -hmm. He needs an extra thing more right. than I do. Um, yeah. I mean, right. a, probably the most straightforward way is that the town buys it and Lucky does his paperwork and all matches everything versus you guys paying for it then giving having to do the paperwork to give it to the town and then the town having to do the DMV. But then in procurement we would need those they record the of the yeah, yeah. But we need the record if we're buying it. We can't yeah. just be like, oh yeah, right. Like right. they can hand yeah. those over probably to us. I think, you know, the I think where you're at in this right now is there is a process to do it. It's that agreement of what it looks like mm -hmm. that's out there. The transfer and the and the training and the policy of the mechanics of how it moves. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. This would be a good one to have everything for. It's a weird transaction compared to our normal ones, so to have everything there makes it easier if the auditor says What were you thinking? <laughs> can, can I see what you have related to this? And if Mike has some of those things that he's located in his research or whatnot. He said he would. Yeah. He said he was willing to give you guys any hands that he needed to uh, help take the burden off our town manager's office. Okay. Okay. Do you have what you need? I think so. Tonight? Okay. All right. Anyway. Sounds good. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. All right, adopting the MP01.
for the Vermont Community Development Program. <laughs> I'm not going to be able to sit next to Stephanie anymore. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I accidentally showered today, so no problem. Well, I'm probably just allergic to all of you. I might have to resign. <laughs> you can just zoom in instead. Loophole. Did you not hear when we said if we approve? The greater I meant you and John had to stay through. <laughs> <laughs> Did not catch that. that no. um, also excusing at that point. Um, All right, so what's this? One? All right. This is a standard requirement. This is tied to any grants we receive, primarily through the community development program or the housing and community affairs. Cool. Housing, no, it was housing and community affairs. Now it's DHCD, whatever that works out to be. This it looks like standard stuff. So like we don't discriminate and right. we aren't mean. Yeah, we don't want drugs in the world. We're not mean. We're not mean in a way so that violates federal law. <laughs> <laughs> it still might not be nice, but not that mean. Cool. So we just need to sign this. Yeah. Cool. Uh, we'll adopt it. Are doing a motion for that? Yeah. A motion made. Um, we're gonna adopt this thing. Is that good? Approve it. <laughs> <laughs> so moved. <laughs> Yeah. Right. I got the MP1. Oh yeah, it was in my packet. It's oh, you already got it? Yeah. <laughs> right on top of it, sir. Right. Go ahead and yeah. go on vacation, we got this. Yeah. Uh, the 25 grants and aid program participation. Uh, I forgot to ask John what we might do. So Ferris Road is the one we're doing. We're going to do that this summer um, through this program. This is a letter to participate in the next round. Well, I should probably should clarify. These are annual grants. We use them on our orange, which is our priority segments from a road erosion inventory. Um, the ones we did all held up really well in July. So there's a lot of armoring, ditching, make sure ditch is the right shape, grounding, a little widening. We're usually around like thirty, thirty-two thousand dollars is the type of award we match it. We usually match it in kind, so we use any rental costs, staff time. So what's the motion for this one? Make a motion to authorize the town manager to sign the fiscal year 25 grants and aid letter of intent. Second. <laughs> All those in favor. Aye. <laughs> <Right>. Aye. <laughs> you guys voting? Aye. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, yay, yay, yay. Carries. <laughs> water, wastewater allocation, and stop billing recommendations. We have two recommendations from the Water Wastewater Committee. One is tied to some additional capacity on Heading Drive for an RACDC project. And then the stop billing recommendation is the 15 Lincoln Avenue property currently owned by Brenda Langevin. I don't know if I said that right, but um, she's been living there for years. It's in the flood buyout program. And so the amount that gets charged is usually the base fee, I believe. But so it's 45 and 70, depending on that. Service. Can we do this in one motion or maybe two? Two? We'll do two. Okay. I uh, motion to approve the allocation for three heading drive as recommended by the Water and Wastewater Committee. I can read. Second. <laughs> Those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. I motion to stop water and wastewater billing for 15 Lincoln Ave as recommended by the Wastewater wa the Water and Wastewater Committee. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Um, any discussion on ARPA obligation criteria? I don't mean to be a smart ass, but at this rate, you won't need it. Uh, yep, that was. <laughs> I, <laughs> I, was I that. did ask around, and there wasn't anything else. So they just suggested looking at what the committee looked at. And All right. We'll get you. report. This might be a good time to talk a little bit about the fee and stuff if you want. In terms of what came out of today. Okay. I was trying to keep it brief by not having anything to add given how much we'd already covered, but this one seems like I'm gonna touch base on it pretty quick. Okay, so um yeah. 
John and I met with a contractor. Great. Sure. <laughs> That's basically the best way to put it. Yeah. Um, John and I spent the morning with a contractor yesterday looking at North Randolph Road and uh, Stock Farm Road in the challenges. And we met the state at the Stock Farm Road site. And we thought we had a pretty good, we had great meetings. We thought we had a contractor capable. Totally has the skill set to do with the equipment, what was needed. Thought we were like gonna have the meetings today with Jaron. We were gonna get approval to work in the streams. Life is gonna be good. And so I said, John, oh, you got this. <laughs> John was in the meeting only a few minutes when he called and he said, hey, what are you doing? <laughs> so I went up. Um, basically, we have six sites on the North Randolph Road, and we can do two of them, three of them. Three, yep. And that's it. Um, and we got shut down on the other three. Yeah, the other three are the big ones. They're the worst ones. Um, we are gonna have to bring in an engineer. Uh, we're gonna have to have plans. The plans are gonna have to go to rivers and streams, and they'll have to approve them now before we can do any work. His comment was, I don't think you're going to find an engineer willing to stamp a set of plans for these three slopes. Which means what? So he thought we were probably looking at some pilings, probably soldier pilings in there to uh, then hold the bank, the back bill up behind them. Not cheap, not easy. Um, it's basically going to delay any work on those three sites while we do it. So in talking with Trevor, we're going to put out um, a single pager like we did during the flood, look to get some engineering firms on, and then send them out to look at it to give us a scope of what they need and what not to look at it. Um, we don't think they're going to have to do borings because you can just look right down there and see the, you know, go get a scoop of it. I'll tell you what it is, you know. Um, the challenge is the water is coming right out of the ground underneath the road, not in culverts or whatever, like just seeping out. We uh, perched the water table on two of the sites. We're down to ledge in the bottom of the river, so we don't even have a bottom that we can work with. We'll be pinning whatever we come up with we'll be pinning into the ledge to try to get it to hold there. Water, the stream guy that was there said our best bet is to push the road back, but we still got to secure that bank too. So um, in talking with FEMA, they got a little squirmy with the push the road back. Yeah. Um, but remember mitigation like that, if it's not in the list of things is only 15% reimbursable uh, and that's not going to be cheap because that bank on the other side same material and there's water coming out of that everywhere yep. so and it's steep so you've got a little bit less of an issue over there maybe but you're still there's going to be an issue on how we retain that bank and cut a road back into it all going to require engineering. So that's the North Randolph Road update. Basically, we can fix up at where Rogers Road comes in. We can restack the inlet outlet side of that with the blocks, but the blocks we want to use for that are down over the, <laughs> on the other <laughs> side that we can't touch. So I'm not really sure how we're going to do that quite yet, but uh, and all the way at the bottom. The washout at the bottom. Um, so not the bridge. No, nope. the bridge. Well, we, we gotta do, engineer the bridge. Yeah, we can do the bridge still. That one okay. is on its regular trajectory. So that yeah. that was the, all fine. The problem with that is that we were looking at a box culvert, and we're on ledge. Box culverts don't sit on ledge very well. So we Maybe probably gotta look at a couple of other, and we have to do a hydraulic analysis of the entire North Randolph Road water corridor and the Kibbe Road water corridor to know because the two come together where that bridge blew out. So we got some work to do there. Um, 
wasn't going to be as good as we thought. We thought the contractor was going to move in next week and start making progress. And he might on the couple, on that one site, you know, maybe be able to get him in there. But um, so then we go over to Stock Farm Road, and remember the that site, the river was in a couple hundred feet at least. Um, July came along, the river decided it was going to make its own little corridor. It now comes up next to the road. December floods hit. It took more of that out, and it just keeps eating it. Uh, it has now eaten the side of the road. Uh, that surface is gone, and on the opposite side, it's a bank. Um, it's So that just whole, this map from that a few whole years field ago. is gone now. That in the center. Right at the road's edge. Mm -hmm. And rightfully so, the people with the house up on that hill are a little nervous. Mm -hmm. um, and so at that site, we were same thing, same contractor was ready to go. He got another uh, large excavator and operator lined up to help him. We've been actually pricing getting the material here using the railroad, dumping it into the town dump um, because of the amount that was needed. But uh, today we were told that this is too big and the Army Corps of Engineers has jurisdiction. So this is going to require a NEPA study and all kinds of good stuff. So that totally put the wet blanket on us on doing anything on this. Like we can't even dump rock down to protect the edge of the road where it is today yeah. until really? all that's done. Yeah. So and how we're, long we looking at months then to get that done? And so we get up with the storm, we can completely yeah. take out Take out the road, road right over to that while house. While we're waiting for a study that's going to come back and say, yeah, you need to do something here. No. That says what we have to do there. Yeah. Well, but I'm just yeah. saying, like... Yeah. But so here's a better one for you. The July storm reimbursement's 90%. The measurements of the damage during the July storm were 168 160, feet, yeah. I think it was. Wow. We're now at 600 feet of area that's got to be played with. Only the 168 feet is what they're telling us is going to be eligible under the July storm at 90% reimbursement. Then there's a December storm, and we put this product, this in too because it lost more. And so now they got to go back and figure out how they're going to handle this because we have 90% reimbursable, we have 75% reimbursable, and then we have outsider right away because we only have so much that's ours. So as soon as we get outside of the right of way, and it's off ours, then we go into FEMA mitigation and we gotta show why we have to wrap that to keep the water from coming in behind whatever work we do. Cause it'll just, if we can't touch it, the water's just gonna go right behind it and take the road out anyway. But we won't be able to push the river back to where it was. The river will go next to the road from now on in this. Also, if you look, there's <clears throat> where that is, uh, kind of where those trees are, those trees are gone. There's a culvert and then there's a, I don't know if it's two culverts or a culvert and a stream that comes through the yeah. underwork me. Uh, it's on the other side actually of it, kind of right in where those trees are right now. Yeah, that's there's two works. huge washouts and one of the washouts is literally coming at that bank this way and the rivers come at it this way. So. It's just one good push of water from coming through that, and then we're going to lose more of the stock farm road coming into that corner. It's not a good site. Um, so at this point, we need to bring an engineering firm on somehow to help us start looking at these. But we also are going to have to bring the Army Corps to the table and look at what they are going to require. A few of these, I've seen them step down and not take jurisdiction, but I don't know if they'll do that at this one or not. So, yeah. 
So when I said we got our hands full right now for the next few weeks, we got our hands full, especially if we think we're going to get this repaired this year. But, you know, we don't repair this and another storm comes in, it's gone. Oh, I know. Yeah, it's awful. So, that's, in a nutshell, yeah. the highway fund that, that we've been having the last couple days. <laughs> the highs and lows. Well, it's been a good plan. We were getting action ready. We even talked to the Rivers guy on the phone, John and I had. He said, yeah, send me over what the trans wants to do. Probably get going on the permit right away. I'm going to come out, leave for a site visit tomorrow. We left yesterday feeling like, all right. Yeah, we're good. The contractor's coming. The permit's coming. Life is good. So if that's where that is, mm -hmm. we'll have to <clears throat> go out and get an engineer on board and take it from there. Um, but my guess is we're probably better off at the table with an engineer and starting the conversation with the Army Corps. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Here we are with just us, because they'll know the buzzwords of how we might be able to get them to Ooh. back down on some of it or move quicker. But those hydraulic analysis are going to take a long time too, so they're going to stand up for whatnot. So, and we got to have those to do the bridge. Be nice if the state could use some ARPA transportation funds that they can't <laughs> figure out other plans for to help with town FEMA stuff match. Transportation ARPA the funds are gone six times over. <laughs> I thought I, you're having plan trouble because of how long the plans were. Uh, I don't think so. It hasn't come up in any of the budget meetings. But. Well, trust me, I am at the table pounding for what we need when it comes up. Every now and then, poor Trevor will get a hey. <laughs> <laughs> quick, quick, quick. <laughs> Get in the queue. Tomorrow's a cutoff. We're not going to be in this event. Did you know it was? Did you know mud season is now female eligible? Yeah. If it's in December. Anything else around just report for tonight? Isn't that enough? <laughs> well, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. Well. <laughs> One item, but we packed it full of nutritional value. Uh, uh, do we need executive session? There's anything that can't wait. I was going to update you on the first collective bargaining session, which is next week now, so that didn't even occur. Um, we're going to talk about a few other things, but they'll hold. Some of them I need to hear from Mike Tarrant on anyway. Uh, might give us a better frame of the conversation. Yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't mind meeting in three weeks. Yeah. yeah. Honestly, at this point. There's also, yeah, the diminishing. This is a really uh, long one for us. Well, then we yeah. still got the liquor board. Oh, so, crap. If anybody wants to make a motion to adjourn, so. So moved. <laughs> Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. We will call the liquor board to order. Did we, warn, did we warn the liquor board meeting? No, we amended our agenda to do it. We did. Mm -hmm. Okay, I missed that. At the beginning. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, I was late. It'll be quick, I promise. Because we have He's no public so comment. He's always been so So, on the agenda, we have... Wesco, One Main, Scott Perkins, and Wee Bird Bagel Cafe. Why is it underneath the owner's name instead of the business? I don't know. Does it matter for us if we no. approve it as is? Okay. We're approving it for him, not for a business. Okay. For this, so. Okay. Uh, um, a motion to approve all the liquor control board permits and applications and okay. requests. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. <laughs> Opposed? Motion carries. Anybody want to adjourn that board? So moved. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. We are done.